distinguished participants, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen. Welcome to the second Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, CSIS Germany, Indonesia Strategic Dialogue. My name is Ilan Kumbara and I will be your host today. We will begin today's event with a welcoming remark from Dr. Philip Grimontin, the Executive Director of CSIS, and from Mr. Jan Sengel, Director of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Between uh, second track uh, think tanks and universities. 
we realized yesterday that the fact that the challenge that we have ranging from traditional security issues to non-traditional security issues, all of which require thorough understanding between the two countries. Another important point was that next year, Indonesia and Germany, <coughs> Indonesia needs to cooperate with Germany as a non permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations. I hope that our event today will highlight more on some of the challenges that we have, and I wish you all a very successful and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, Mr. Jan Zinke, to deliver his welcoming remarks as well. Again, floor is yours. by the vision uh, uh, presented by 
President Joko Widodo about the about Indonesia becoming a maritime global maritime fulcrum, and this includes uh, the development of infrastructure, of uh, the sea power, of the new economy, uh, and of resilience. And this is a huge task for this country. For Germany, as the largest economy in Europe and the fourth largest economy in the world, uh, being basically uh, oriented to export, that means we are an export country, uh, this of utmost interest the guarantee of safety of uh, sea line, trade lines uh, and sea lines of communication. Therefore, also for Germany, maritime uh, cooperation and uh, security is of big uh, interest. So I'm uh, happy that uh, together with CSIS, uh, we managed to gather uh, a number of uh, experts and, and um, uh, speakers from Germany and also from Indonesia in order to discuss this issue. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Dave Zermonde for the excellent cooperation and the partnership with uh, the Center of Strategic and International Studies. And I wish all the participants uh, an interesting and uh, fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for those welcoming remarks. I would now like to invite the Governor of the Indonesian National Resilience Institute, Lieutenant General Agus Wijoyo, to deliver his keynote speech. Where are you going in this early morning today? 
di Repubblica di Italia. Ah, ma è un ufficio di CSIS now. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you for CSIS for that. Uh, <coughs> yes, uh, I'm asked to address on the English spiritual in world and by Falcon. First, I will uh, give the background uh, and then uh, I will move into the various aspects of the uh, Indonesian uh, maritime uh, situation and finally uh, to perceive uh, the subject from uh, the national resilience point of view and uh, expectations for cooperation between Indonesia and Germany. But time issues currently have been taken into high concern by most of countries in the world due to some distinctive potentials. The domain of this issue deserves more awareness and attention because its potentials could bring prosperity and welfare of societies. All nations around the world give focus to maritime potentials because of its key strategic and massive contribution to prosperity and welfare that could create a massive contribution to all mankind. Indonesia is the largest archipelago country that has the potential to become the world maritime axis. Indonesia is widely an archipelago with two-thirds of the ocean area larger than the mainland. This can be seen with the various beaches in Indonesia, more or less uh, at the distance uh, of 81,000 kilometers, uh, in length, which made Indonesia a country called the longest beach in the world. A large amount of power to advance the Indonesian economy, especially from the maritime sector. The world maritime axis aims to become Indonesia as a large, strong and prosperous maritime country through the restoration of Indonesia's identity as a maritime nation, empowering maritime potentials to realize Indonesia's economic equality. As a country, Indonesia is a dream endowed with abundant potential and natural resources that have become strengths and ambition to achieve the country's goals which are considered in the preamble of the 1945 constitution. As a consequence of Indonesia's very strategic position, Indonesia is very important for the world community. It means that the Indonesian people are able to take advantage of opportunities and challenges and would be able to improve the character uh, of the uh, Indonesian people. The strategic position occupied by Indonesia is very important in the geopolitical sense. Aside from being a strategic sea lane, the potential of marine resources are also abundant. A maritime country is a country capable of utilizing the sea even though the country doesn't have many seas but has the ability of technology, science, equipment, etc. to manage and utilize the sea, both in space and its natural wealth and its strategic provision. The concept of a maritime country as an effort to maintain and strengthen national resilience so that Indonesia will become more resilient. Important aspects in building maritime resilience such as from the aspect of regulation, policy, budget support and infrastructure need to be improved to anticipate the increasingly complex dynamics of challenges and threats. To become a maritime country, Indonesia must be able to manage and utilize its marine wealth and space, including understand various types of Indonesian seas with various provisions, recognize and respect international rights over Indonesian waters, able to eradicate illegal practices and prevent all forms of lawlessness in Indonesian territorial waters as well as in the vicinity of areas of authority. Able to establish and manage maritime waters with neighboring countries and maintain common security and able to maintain the safety of shipping through in Indonesian waters capable of utilizing natural resources and space outside Indonesian waters such as in the free sea and on the international seabed. This means that in addition to Indonesia having to guarantee maritime security in its jurisdictional waters, Indonesia must also care and pay attention to various regional maritime security issues, especially those that have emerged in the Southeast Asia region. 
If the problem of maritime security is not handled properly, it will have implications for the resilience of nature. Article 33, paragraph 3 of the 1945 Constitution states that the earth and water and natural resources contained therein are controlled by the state and are used for the, pro for the prosperity of the people. I will move next into the current state of the Indonesian maritime situation. Indonesia is ranked the third largest in the world in fisheries production under China and India. In addition, Indonesian waters store 70% of oil potential because there are approximately 40 oil basins in the Indonesian waters. Of this number, only around 10% is currently explored and utilized. This shows that Indonesia has not yet felt the significant growth of maritime potential that has been characterized by lack of maximum management of Indonesia's maritime potential. With the diversity of Indonesia's maritime potential, including the marine biotechnology industry, deep water, maritime tourism, marine energy, marine minerals, shipping, defense, and the maritime industry, it can actually make a major contribution to the welfare and prosperity of the Indonesian people. What are the challenges in Indonesia to Indonesia as a global maritime partner? The geographic challenges consist of the number and locations of the Indonesian archipelago provinces which are relatively large so that inter-island connectivity is needed. There are eight provinces, most of which are bordered by the sea, namely the Riau Islands, Bangla Bitung, Nusa Tenggara Barat, Nusa Tenggara Timur, means uh, Western Nusa Tenggara and Eastern Nusa Tenggara, North Sulawesi, Southeast Sulawesi, North Maluku and Maluku. In these provinces, maritime sector development is very important. There are also maritime infrastructure challenges, namely the challenges of maritime infrastructure. Infrastructure includes three aspects. One, maritime manufacturing industry with another location distribution and national shipyard industry capacity as the challenges. Second, the national shipping industry, the number, the type, the capacity, the age of the national ship fleet, and the national seaport. Equitable development from West to East Indonesia is needed in developing the Indonesian maritime sector. What are Indonesia's potentials as a global maritime platform? In the direction of world maritime access, developments from the aspect of infrastructure, politics, social culture, law, security and economy is needed. Enforcement of the sovereignty of the Republic of Indonesia territorial waters revitalization of marine economic sectors, strengthening and development of maritime connectivity, environmental damage rehabilitation, and biodiversity conservation, as well as improving the quality and quantity of marine human resources, are the main programs in effort to realize Indonesia as a world maritime partner. In addition to the special improvements and attention given in the field of technology to managing natural resources in the Indonesian seas, port development and sea transportation are also needed to encourage Indonesian maritime activities to become more modern and easy to use by the community. As a maritime country, Indonesia also has no less potential than other maritime countries. Indonesia has wider and more diverse marine resources. Our fisheries and biotechnology industries are estimated to have an economic value of 82 billion US dollars per year. For many tourism activities, it is estimated that economic value is far greater than the state of Queensland, which has been able to earn for the exchange of more than 3 billion US dollars per year. The reality shows how extensive Indonesia's marine economic potential is. Moreover, Indonesia is the largest archipelagic country in the world, saves the most marine biodiversity compared to other countries. If this potential is utilized optimally, it can support national economic development significantly. From various economic activities, it can contribute to the country's foreign exchange, which is quite large. A, con a number of countries, such as Norway, prove by relying on their marine resources 
proven to be able to become one of the richest countries in the world. For one type of salmon, Norway is able to export around 500,000 metric tons, which is the same value as all Indonesian fishing products. Various aspects which constitute elements of maritime and maritime development can be grouped into two major parts. The first group is the economic aspect of maritime, and uh, which are the main aspects of the development of the maritime axis. The second group are aspects that are components of governance, which will determine how the first aspect can be managed and developed in its direction to realize the maritime full of power. These two aspects groups are integratively, integratively important to be managed as Indonesia is going to be done the world of maritime access. What are the potentials in maritime economics? All aspects of the economy of maritime affairs and elements of governance are in one container of sea land in Indonesia as a whole. The sustainability of coastal and marine functions will also determine the existence and sustainability of the marine ecosystem cycle and its ability to sustain the sea land economy that will develop into Indonesia's domain as the maritime axis. Without maintaining the quality of ecosystems on land, water, coast, and sea, there will be no economic sustainability of maritime and maritime forces as opposed to what's the world maritime axis. Fisheries and marine resources need to be managed so that they remain abundant natural resources in Indonesian waters. The strength of the national fishing fleet, over large and medium scale, needs to be strengthened in ending illegal fishing. Fisheries have great potential, especially sea and practice cultivation, which need to be utilized optimally, where the contribution will continue to increase in line with the increase in fish consumption in the world. Improvement of capture fisheries management, which requires more appropriate fisheries management area, or WWP, because even though there are inevitable WWP stipulations, it has not been used as a tool for strategic fisheries regional development. With the increasing demand for world fish consumption and domestic needs, increasing productivity and production of aquaculture and capture fisheries is important. The potentials in oil, gas, and sea minerals are abundant. Offshore oil and gas and seabed minerals are, as energy sources are new potentials for marine services that must be developed. The control of the Indonesian people over these assets is still low, and the access to energy in all regions of Indonesia has not been evenly distributed. Exploration and exploitation of offshore minerals and the sea floor need to be carried out that way. Development of domestic capacity in mastering oil and gas and mineral businesses needs to be improved both in terms of technical mastery, human resources development, and capital capabilities. The potential in sea transportation can be addressed as follows. Sea transportation is an important aspect of the maritime axis. During this time, the land-oriented development paradigm the sea was treated as a land separated of the Union Republic of Indonesia. As a result, the sea transportation system lags behind the development of air and land transportation. The maritime development provides a mandate that the sea becomes a link between islands. So sea transportation is the most important adhesive and the element for the construction of the maritime axis. Sea transportation must be able to connect between islands effectively so that new growth centers outside Java will develop, thereby reducing the gap between Java and the outer islands. The development of sea transportation needs to be supported by the development of the maritime industries, which includes the construction of shipyards and ship component industries, for development and the shipping industry, which must be carried out effectively for the realization of maritime connectivity. As the chair of the National Resilience Institute, uh, I, uh, I cannot pass without the uh, importance of the global maritime part from international resilience perspective. The maritime resilience perspective is not only law enforcement at sea, but also covers a broader range of synergies. 
apart from the existence of two mutually binding public interests, namely national interest and international interest. First, the sea is free from threat of violence, namely the threat of using armed forces that are organized and judged to have the ability to disrupt and endanger state sovereignty, whether in the form of military threats, piracy, sabotage of vital objects or acts of terror. Second, the sea is free from threats to marine resources in the form of pollution, over-exploitation and destruction of ecosystems. Third, the sea is free from illegal fishing. Maritime economic development needs to be supported by a strong defense and security system so that it can sustain the use of domains that are built into geo-economic and geo-political strategic forces. Integrated land and, and sea defense and security systems need to be built according to the needs. The right balance of the land, sea, air personnel and defense and security equipment needs to be developed to maintain the dignity and defend the country when in which will carry out the role as the world to maritime access. Making Indonesia a maritime partner in the world is a big challenge, so that full treatment is needed for all aspects involved in the eye, realizing it. Other maritime security issues that also need attention are non-conventional threats, especially those that come from various acts of transnational crime, which directly threaten the authority and territory of the country, including piracy and piracy and maritime terrorism. Southeast Asian waters, especially the Malacca Strait, are quite important as strategic shipping lines that connect the Asian region with Europe and the Middle East. The increasing number of international shipping, especially merchant ships and foreign oil tankers passing through the waters of Southeast Asia, can invite the attention of certain groups of parties who intend to commit crimes to carry out piracy. Then the resilience of the Indonesian maritime sector must also be a concern in securing the sovereignty of the Republic of Indonesia from all threats. Looking at the current condition of Indonesian maritime affairs, the maritime sector can be disturbed by other countries, so a considerable defense is needed given the relatively large threat level and wider Indonesian waters compared to neighbor countries. National resilience in the maritime sector must also be balanced with all aspects that are adequate, both infrastructure, technology, and human resources. In this case, the Indonesian Navy, with all its teams, is able to secure the Indonesian sea sector in creating Indonesian maritime security and resilience. By having strong resilience in the maritime field, Indonesia can have a stronger potential to become the world's maritime access so that the Indonesian sea can become a trade center or container transit without having to fear the security potential that could disrupt Indonesia's maritime security and create conditions safe and comfortable for other countries that trust Indonesian maritime international rules. Finally, I have the pleasure to address the global maritime power potential in the bilateral cooperation framework between Indonesia and Germany. Indonesia's maritime potential is so great that this is Indonesia's current focus in creating the maintaining of national resilience. Indonesia needs to direct its diplomatic targets to support the achievement as a maritime access country. With these various potentials, one of the steps that need to be carried out by Indonesia is infrastructure development and maritime connectivity, including in the development of the shipping and maritime industry, as well as cooperation in the maritime sector. Germany is a country that has a maritime industry sector with a strong foundation. Supported by intensive research and development, the German maritime industry experienced extraordinary developments. German maritime industry contributed significantly, significantly to their economic growth. Moreover, Germany has a mid-term maritime agenda up to 2025 so that Germany can better enhance their maritime industry quality. Indonesia and Germany established bilateral relations in the maritime axis as a manifestation of the achievements of Indonesia and Germany as strong maritime axis. Potentials that can be extracted from this cooperation is the shipping and equipment industries, processing of marine uh, machinery, automotive components, 
Petrol Chemical, Coal Gasification, and Downstream Agro Products. The industrial investment includes export of ethyl labor and is used for substitution sectors. Increasing market access for the two countries needs to be improved. Cooperation in maritime security, maritime security and safety, maritime infrastructure investment, shipyard investment, research and technology cooperation, and training are expected to be able to answer the challenges of the two countries in their maritime sector cooperation so as to maximize the maritime potential of the countries. By having strong cooperation in the maritime field, Indonesia and Germany can have a great potential in the maritime sector, so that the seas of Indonesia and Germany are very adequate in becoming a trade lane or container transit without fear of potential security effects that can disrupt Indonesia's maritime security and Germany and create safe and comfortable conditions for other countries to pass through maritime rules of the two countries. The two countries have the role to maintain the process of wealth and maritime potentials in their respective countries. To process the marine natural resources, infrastructure improvements, human resources improvement, and technological modernizations are needed. And with this cooperation, it is expected that the achievement of the two countries in the maritime sector will run better. Establishment of cooperation between Indonesia and Germany in the maritime field places the importance of good relations between the two countries, which will continue into the future. And finally, to conclude, with all aspects possessed by Indonesia and the challenge of making Indonesia as the world's maritime partner, it's not possible to be realized without the cooperation with Germany. The maritime sector of the two countries is expected to be stronger. With the potential of the two countries, it is expected to be able to maintain resilience and maritime sovereignty by utilizing maritime natural resources for respective countries. Thank you for your attention, and I wish a healthy and productive discussion during the seminar or during the strategic dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Baba, Mr. Jacob, for delivering your keynote address. Um, and I'd like to ask the gentlemen to please stay with their stage. And I would like also to invite all of the CUS delegation, also the speakers for today, to come to the stage for a photo session. Thank you.
Um, very good morning. I think we can start with the first session. Uh, I'd like to invite our distinguished speakers to the stage. Uh, Dr. Seven Pound, Director of the International Institute for International Law at the University of Bonn, please come to the stage. And uh, Professor Melda Kamil Ariano, Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Indonesia. Please come to book. Thank you. And Admiral Dr. Castro Bunko, uh, head of Nava Legal Service in the Indonesian Navy. Please come. Now, this first session, uh, we will discuss rules-based approach to maritime security. Uh, we will discuss the legal aspects of maritime security, including international law and the development of regional approaches to rules-based maritime order. And uh, I think we are privileged to have these distinguished speakers that can give very insightful understanding of uh, the topic that uh, of a particular importance of the issue of maritime security. Now I'd like to invite Pak Stephen, sorry, Dr. Stephen Hammond, yes. the Director of the Institute for International and Digital Support, to deliver his presentation. Mm -hmm. Pak Stephen, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at the Germany Indonesia Strategic Dialogue. This is my first visit to Indonesia, uh, and it felt like a homecoming because one of the things I do in my academic work is I work islands, and there's probably no better place to go than Indonesia with its 17,000 islands. Now, what I want to talk uh, to you today is about Germany's rules-based approach to maritime security. Now, perhaps to start off, uh, I want to give you a brief introduction to Germany and the sea, or Germany and the law. We have heard yesterday that Germany basically is a land power. The law of the sea, maritime issues, hardly play any role at all in the public debate in Germany. And you can see why. If you look at the German coastline, uh, you can see, uh, and especially if you compare it to Indonesia, uh, it's a very short coastline. You've just heard that Indonesia has 81,000 kilometers of coastline. Germany, in comparison, just has 2,400. Now, if we think about uh, the size of the exclusive economic zone of our uh, two countries, uh, you can see the dark blue here on the picture is the German exclusive economic zone. And, of course, Germany's exclusive economic zone is rather small. It's about 80,000 square kilometers. Now, compare that to Indonesia, where we have 2.7 million square kilometers of exclusive economic sector. So just to give you uh, a glimpse of the uh, relation between the two countries as far as the sea is concerned. But of course, Germany is a major industrialized country. It's the fourth largest economy in the world, we have heard. And 90% of our foreign trade 
tray outside in the U is shipped by sea. Germany's got the fourth largest merchant fleet in the world after Greece, Japan, and China. And Germany has just been overtaken by China as the country with the largest container vessel fleet. And just to give you again uh, an impression, uh, Germany's container vessel fleet is worth about 19 billion US dollars. And it's just been trumped by Chinese, uh, which, have re which has reached 21 billion US dollars. But it shows to you that although Germany, unlike Indonesia, is not a major maritime state, Germany has major maritime interests. And of course, our main interest is freedom and security of navigation. This is important for us to secure the supply lines for our industry and to ship our goods to the world. Now, Germany has a strong interest in questions of piracy, maritime terrorism, and cyber attacks on shipping. Germany basically is a good citizen in terms of the international rules-based legal order. We have basically signed up to almost any treaty under the sun concerning the law of the sea and maritime uh, security. Just in September of this year, the German and Singaporean foreign minister met at the UN General Assembly and agreed that Germany would now even join the regional cooperation agreement on combating piracy and armed robbery against ships in Asia. Here, of course, I was surprised, and I might get some answers from my colleagues on the podium, because when I did some research, I found out that basically 14 Asian countries are parties to this treaty, together with Norway, the Netherlands, Denmark, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And in the future, perhaps Germany, but not Indonesia. So I would be very interested to learn why Indonesia hasn't joined uh, this treaty yet. Now, what I want to look at uh, in the context of the rules based approach to maritime security is Germany's difficult fight against piracy. I want to look at the legal rules that apply in Germany to the fight against piracy. And you will see that, uh, as in many cases in Germany, law actually provides quite an obstacle for Germany to fight piracy. A rules-based approach to international problems is not always an easy route to take. And you can see this, uh, a number of international and national laws play a major role in Germany's fight against piracy. So we have, of course, to look at international treaties and customary international law, but also the German Criminal Code, the German Constitutional Law, resolutions of the UN Security Council, European Union law, German administrative law, and European human rights law. All this plays, plays an important part in uh, Germany's fight against Paris. And I want to take you, by a little case study, uh, through the German rules that apply to fighting Paris. So if the German government would decide to launch an operation against pirates anywhere in the world, what rules would apply if we wanted to do this? And of course, it would start out with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea as a starting point. This basically is the international law framework. UNCLOS, as it is called, provides the competence to combat piracy but of course not armed robbery. So, under Article 105 of the United Nations Convention on the Sea, 
every state may seize the pirate ship and the rest of the persons and seize the property on board. And of course, Article 107 uh, provides who may do this. It may be done by warships, by military aircraft, or by government ships that are authorized to that effect. International law also refers to domestic law, domestic criminal law. Once you have arrested a pirate, then you may actually try the pirate before your own courts. This is about the extraterritorial exercise of criminal jurisdiction. Now, let's move on to the German criminal law, and that's probably the least problematic aspect of fighting piracy, because of course, in the German criminal code, somewhere hidden, no student knows about it, we find a provision that allows German courts to try piracy. And of course, uh, it doesn't talk about piracy, it talks about technology, attacks on air and maritime traffic. But of course, this, in other words, is piracy. This section 6 extends German criminal law and not just with regard to piracy, also with drug, drug trafficking or human trafficking to all parts of the world. So even if a German vessel would arrest a pirate in uh, the Strait of Malacca, for example, they could be tried back home in Germany before the German courts. However, that doesn't say anything uh, about the question whether Germany, uh, German authorities or German security forces may actually fight pirates. Whether we could actually send a vessel to the Strait of Malacca to fight piracy there together with Indonesian armed forces. For that, we have to look at the German constitution. As I told you before, Article 107 of the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea uh, says that pirates may be combated by warships, military aircraft, or other government ships. And if you think about the fight against piracy, we think, of, of course, about military forces to combat piracy. So, in particular, we would think about naval forces. But that raises the question whether under German constitutional law the German Navy is actually allowed to fight piracy. And here you see Article 87, Paragraph A, which says that the Federation shall establish armed forces for the purposes of defense. And the question here that arises is fighting piracy a question of defense. And in principle, the answer is no. Under German law, fighting pirates is not defense. So the question is, is there a way out? In the 1990s, the German Constitutional Court said, yes, apart from defense, German armed forces may be used if they are used in a system of mutual collective security. Now, of course, this raises the question, what is a system of mutual collective security. And of course, again, the, the, the German constitutional court here is quite clear. A system of mutual collective security is the United Nations, first and foremost. So if there is a UN mandate, there is no problem according to German constitutional law to fight piracy anywhere in the world. But you would need a UN Security Council mandate, otherwise you would have a problem. So with regard to fighting piracy off the coast of Somalia, this is not a problem because we had various Security Council resolutions passed in 2008 and are still in force today. And they are the legal basis of German armed forces' presence of the coast of Somalia. But this is why such resolutions are very important to Germany in terms of German constitutional law. 
So the question is, are there any other systems of mutual collective security which could provide a legal basis for the fight against piracy? Now, now of course, you could think about the European Union as another system of mutual collective security after NATO. Uh, sorry, far from the United Nations. But of course, the German Constitutional Court in 2009 closed the door and said the European Union is not yet a system of mutual collective security. So even if the European Union would authorize the fight against piracy, this would not be sufficient in German domestic law. The only other system of mutual collective security that is accepted by the German Constitutional Court is NATO. So only if we have a Security Council mandate or if we have a decision by the NATO Council, German armed forces can be used to fight piracy worldwide. Now, is that already the end of the story? So what happened if Indonesia would ask Germany for assistance in the fight against piracy, unless there would be a Security Council mandate, Germany could not come to the assistance of Indonesia because it's highly unlikely that like, NATO would pass resolution saying you should go to the Strait of Malacca and help the Indonesians defend themselves against piracy. But even if we had a Security Council mandate, as we had in the case of Somalia, uh, this is still not the end of the matter. Uh, because, of course, the German Constitutional Court said in one of its decisions that the German armed forces are a parliamentary army. That means German armed forces cannot be deployed outside of Germany unless there is the prior approval by the German Parliament, by the Bundestag. So any operations of German armed forces outside Germany need the positive prior approval. Now the question of course is, is the fight against piracy really deployment of armed forces abroad? According to the Constitutional Court, yes, it is. Too quickly. In two important decisions of 2009 and 2015, the German Constitutional Court applied a very extensive interpretation of the term deployment of armed forces, which means that even if we deploy the German Navy to fight piracy, this is proper deployment which requires in each individual case the prior approval by the German public. <laughs> so apart from a Security Council mandate or a decision by NATO, in addition, we need the approval of the German public. Now, if that is already complicated, uh, I must tell you it even gets more complicated. Because in Germany and in German law, we have a principle which says that the government, the authorities, they only act if there is a positive basis in law. So we actually need a law which says the German armed forces are allowed to fight pirates. Now, here we have a problem, because we don't have such a law. We have, on the contrary, a law which says, if you want to fight pirates outside German territorial waters, you have to send the German Federal Police. It's a police power, not a power of the military. Now, here we have a problem in Germany. Because, of course, we have a federal police, which is, under law, competent to fight piracy. But the German federal police doesn't have any ships. Now, on the other hand, we have the German Navy, which I hope still has some ships. 
But there is no law for the German Navy to fight the pirates. So actually, under German law, the German armed forces are not allowed to fight pirates. So even if you have a security council mandate, even if you have the approval of the German parliament, we still cannot send our forces abroad to fight pirates. Now, of course, you know, uh, where there is a lawyer, there is always a way. So a way around these problems. Uh, and of course, here, the European Union comes to rescue. Now, the European Union is, of course, not a system of mutual collective security, but Germany is a member of the European Union, and there is another legal principle which says European law trumps German law. So European law is better than German law. It always takes precedent and prevails. Now, so this is the way out. We actually get the European law, which says the German armed forces may fight pirates. So again, you think about the fight against piracy off the coast of Somalia. In 2008, after we had the Security Council resolution, after we had the approval of the German Parliament, suddenly the European Union adopted this Council joint action on the European Union military operation to contribute to deterrence, prevention, and repression of acts of piracy and armed robbery off the coast of Somalia. And as you can see here, the most important term in that document is a military operation. Because European law says the fight against piracy off the coast of Somalia is conducted as a military operation, this council joint action trumps section 6 of the German Federal Police Code and allows the German armed forces to deploy off the coast of Somalia. So, are we happy? Is that great? No, it isn't, because, of course, law creates another obstacle. Uh, again, I take you back to German constitutional law. Uh, in the German constitution, in Article 1, paragraph 3, it says, The following basic rights shall bind the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary as directly applicable law. The basic rights are human rights, are civil rights. Now, Article 1, Paragraph 3 means that the German armed forces, wherever they go in the world, or even if they go to the moon, they would be covered by Article 1, Paragraph 3, and they would be bound by the basic rights in the German Constitution. So even if you are off the coast of Somalia, if you arrest a pirate, this action is subject to the German Constitution. And then look at Article 104, what it says. Under the German Constitution, if you want to arrest someone, you need a formal law as a legal basis for that arrest. And of course, even if you have a law that you may arrest someone, uh, you will also have to bring that person before a judge within 48 hours. Now think about it. German armed forces arrest someone off the coast of Somalia. How do you bring that person before a judge within 24 or 48 hours? For that reason, again, we needed the UN Security Council. We go back to another Security Council resolution, which basically asked every state to conclude special agreements and arrangements to facilitate the investigation and prosecution of persons detained off the coast of Somalia. In addition, we had a European Union directive which actually said we can hold someone not just for 48 hours, but for 12 days. But then we have to bring that person before a judge. Now, on the basis of that Security Council resolution, then the European Union again concluded international agreements with countries in the region, for example here a agreement with Kenya, so that Kenya would actually take the pirates, put them on trial in Kenya, 
and so to relieve the German armed forces of their burden, namely the pirates on their ships. And this agreement here on the 6th of March, March 2009 came exactly two days after the German frigate Rheinland Pfalz had arrested nine pirates which could then be turned over to uh, Kenya for trial. Now, with the permission of the German, let me just finish this, because, again, this is not yet the end of the problems of the German army, the rules-based approach to the fight against piracy, because they haven't thought about the European Convention on Human Rights yet. Now, the European Convention on Human Rights basically provides in Article 1 that any person that is within the jurisdiction of a party to the European Convention of Human Rights enjoys the rights and freedoms that are laid down in that convention. So, if pirates off the coast of Somalia could actually be seen as within the jurisdiction of Germany, then they enjoy all the rights and freedoms of the European Convention of Human Rights. And what's even better, they can take Germany to court before the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Now, again, you could say, can that be that a pirate in Somalia, off the coast of Somalia, is subject to the jurisdiction of Germany and enjoys all the rights and freedoms of the European Convention on Human Rights? Yes, says the European Court of Human Rights in a famous decision of 2010. As soon as military forces on the ship, on the high seas, or in the territorial sea of another state, apprehend a pirate, that pirate is under the jurisdiction of Germany and enjoys all the rights and freedoms of the Convention. Now, what does that mean in practice? Here we have another famous decision of 2012, the case of Hilsey, which says, if a pirate or another person is within your jurisdiction, you cannot turn that pirate over to any other country if the pirate would face a danger to his life, if he may be tortured, or if he or she may face uh, inhuman or degrading treatment. So now we have a treaty with Kenya that we can turn over these pirates to Kenya, but if the pirate says, oh, wait a minute, I may be tortured in Kenya, uh, and can actually say there is a strong presumption that I will be tortured, but I don't get a fair trial in Kenya, then Germany cannot turn over that pirate to Kenya, and so we are stuck with a pirate on board our vessels somewhere off the coast of Somalia. What does that mean? We have to bring the pirate thousands of kilometers back to Germany and put the pirate on trial, and that happened for the first time in October 2012. After 400 years, this was the first piracy trial in Germany again, and 10 pirates, which the German Navy had apprehended on the coast of Somalia, were put on trial for the courts in Hamburg, and they were <coughs> jailed for between two and seven years, which is quite lenient for piracy. In other countries, you might face the death penalty if you are convicted of piracy. Now, I want to end with my question, what next? Now, 2012, we have apprehended these people, we have brought them to Germany, we have put them on trial. Now we are basically six, seven years later. What happened to the pirates? They've all, of course, come free, because if you are sentenced to seven years in jail in Germany, of course, you will not serve seven years in jail. You will probably be released out five years. And so what happened to these ten pirates? Four left voluntarily and went back to Somalia. One of the pirates went to Sweden, and five are still living happily in Germany. Because, of course, pirates normally don't carry passports. And the Somali embassy in Germany refuses to issue passports to the Somali pirates. Now, to add insult to injury here, uh, we have apprehended these people. 
They are now stuck in Germany uh, because they don't work. We have to provide them with free housing, social security benefits, and probably they will live happily ever after in Germany for the rest of their years. So you can already see I'm not necessarily recommending this kind of a rules-based approach to the fight against piracy and maritime security. Thank you very much for your attention. for providing us with uh, cautious ideas about how complexity of the uh, law with regard to the, the legal aspect of the rules-based approach to maritime security from a human perspective. Now I'd like to invite uh, Professor Melda Kamila Agenon, the Dean of Faculty of Law of the University of Indonesia, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning to us all, Director uh, of CSIS, Honorable Head of National Resilience Agency, and uh, of course our very respected senior Professor Hasim Jara. Ladies and gentlemen, so um, I was uh, asked to talk about uh, the legal aspect of Indonesian identity security, which is not very easy. Uh, I like to start with the role of a state as uh, obliged by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is every state needs to observe their role not just as a coastal state but also uh, third state and fourth state. And in trying to do as such, um, I just to remind us all that Indonesia has, has been uh, spelled out as well, that we have a very huge uh, maritime territory and we have actually a very complete maritime zone uh, from internal waters. If you have archipelagic water as an archipelagic uh, state, of course, territorial sea, excessive economic zone, continental south, and then um, contiguous zone as well. Uh, so it's a very huge, you know, um, body of water, but it doesn't mean that Indonesia has been dominating the sea, unfortunately. So I would like to uh, point out that, you know, recently people always say that uh, the traditional threat of the maritime security is piracy. All the other robbery is happening in the, you know, in the jurisdiction under national uh, water. Uh, but also they referring to what they call transnational organized crime. And the definition of transnational organized crime, I think, is now developing. Not just talking about human trafficking, drug trafficking, firearms trafficking, but also talking about illegal fishing, because you know, in the Indonesian case particularly, what we call illegal fishing, transparently illegal fishing done by foreign fishing vessels, also involving what we call transnational organized crime. So the key maritime issues in Southeast Asia, including in Indonesia, uh, that's among other things, maritime boundary dispute. We still have undefined boundaries with our neighbors, uh, points in Malaysia, in uh, northern Kalimantan, in some part in, uh, in uh, central Malacca for the EZ, as well as for the EZ with Australia. So from time to time, our fishermen has been caught, you know, by by the Malaysian uh, fishermen or Australian, uh, I mean, uh, Malaysian uh, police, MMEA or Australian um, authority, and vice versa. Uh, especially in Malaysian fishermen caught by our officers as well. And not to mention that uh, well, piracy has been, you know, uh, been a problem in Setamak from time to time. But of course, the three little states, Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia, are trying to get together to collaborate, you know, to secure Setamaka. And then we have what we call um, the marine resources security as well, and marine environmental security. 
it is expected that there is a lot of dumping as it has been done in donation water. Some of them actually done by, well, generally Indonesian festival, but they are asked by our neighbor state. Still, the proof you know, need to be uh, on the table because otherwise uh, the accused cannot be gone to the specific uh, state. So in version of crime at sea, that involving uh, Indonesia, you know, there are so many international crime, but then when we go about to the piracy, uh, Sota Malaka is among the, the, the point area you know, to have this case. But uh, when we talk about sea robbery, the, the real uh, archaeology water, uh, quite many uh, sea robbery happening in, in this area. And not to mention illegal drug trafficking, human trafficking, and also now we're talking about money pollution, and not just on the high seas, but I just mentioned happening also in Africa water in Indonesia. People smuggling, we have a very big problem with Australia because so many uh, people smuggling actually uh, try to reach Australia from Indonesian shore. And this is uh, creating a problem in diplomatic relation. So I, I don't want to talk uh, much about that. I think everyone of us already know about you know, the universal jurisdiction and dimension where you know, actually John tried to follow this universal jurisdiction and Indonesia trying to make a balance with the territorial jurisdiction as well. Uh, so the terrorism, well, has, there's a lot of contention, you know, has been uh, adopted. We do actually adopted the final convention on transnational organized crime and the two protocols on that, the uh, people smuggling protocol and the human trafficking protocol. So how about the transnational organized crime itself? Here, we're trying to adopt the definition in the web, you know, so, besides um, acknowledging that smuggling of migrants, human you know, trafficking, like trafficking and firearms as a threat of the transnational organized crime, we're trying to also analyze, you know, that the fisheries crime happened in Indonesia really involving the organized crime itself. So the money on the way is there, the corruption is there, and even importing what we call false data. So the international rules of TOC, as I mentioned, we've been adapting this. And if you talk about ASEAN cooperation, Indonesia is among the you know, leader in that. And we adapted um, you know, so many declarations and also the ASEAN election to combat transnational crime. So everything has been spelled out in this you know, ASEAN election. And then we have also the uh, collaboration in you know, maritime uh, issue with ASEAN as well. Uh, the message is actually trying to strengthen the, the, the cooperation in addressing non traditional security issues, particularly in combating transnational, transnational crime and other transboundary challenges. Mind you, it is specifically mentioned that the people smoking and also are you um, is being um, you know addressed as the transnational boundaries challenge with ASEAN. But I think we also need to um, to mention that uh, the IUPC that has been done in Indonesian water, most of the most, most of the actually carried by our neighbor countries, uh, you know, either Vietnam or Thailand or sometimes Philippines. So this is really a challenge um, within our own ASEAN, uh, and then uh, we are trying to get together and see together how we are going to collaborate to prevent this to happen. So, if you're talking about the American cooperation itself, again in ASEAN, we have been involving in you know, quite many arrangements, not just talking about just the joint statement on the Malacca Strait, 
Um, there is a recap, but Indonesia not joined the recap. Uh, if you like to know what is the reason we put as the appeal in a person here, because uh, mostly it is opposed by the Navy, because we like to be independent in securing our threat of Malacca. And then we have the program Ice in the Sky, ASEAN Maritime Cooperation, including ASEAN Maritime Forum. So, what is then the obligation of Indonesia as a public state? This is actually a challenge for our Navy and also for other law enforcers at sea. If you look closely to Indonesian uh, law, we have various law enforcers at sea, ranging from the Navy, uh, the Bakamla Security Management Agency, and then we have also sea police, uh, and then we have specific um, officer, legal officer in specific ministries. Uh, they are actually having a legal basis on specific law relating to the matter. So the problem is how the Indonesia could enforce you know, their law to their own flag vessel. So we're trying to do certain of things. Of course, it is easy and it's more which is much easier and go you know, into the archipelagic border and also in the the sea we do what we call intervention at sea but then intervention at sea, the pure intervention at sea where we could also be able you know, to enforce our law in the high seas and then of course the own cross put it very limited you know, what are the reasons that can be a basis for doing intervention at sea? Whether it's in the piracy, in slave trade, unauthorized, uh, unauthorized for testing, and also the ship without nationality, or pretending not having a nationality, but actually they are a national of the, the warship itself. Now there are times developed about how to do as a seeker of refugee, illegal drug trafficking, and human trafficking. This is actually the challenge for our Navy itself. When I was asked to uh, give a presentation, you know, even uh, in, in, the, uh, in front of the Navy officers, so I really, you know, put this on the table whether the Navy uh, would like to now go much further than, you know, our AZ, go to high seas and try to reimpose our law as, as well, and then also the international crime, uh, to combat international crime happening beyond our national jurisdiction. And the port state control, we've been doing this so far, but actually, if we get into fisheries, we've been also adopting port state measure agreement. So, not just to have something. Uh, you know, useful like to check seaworthiness, you know, protection of the marine environment, whether they are actually doing some, uh, you know, pollution in our marine environment, uh, but also we're trying to deter the um, IUU fishing by rejecting to those fishing vessels, uh, whatever the plan is, to load their catch in our port if they cannot. Um, you know, give a true certification or certainly a certificate where they catch, whether it's catch by having a legal visit. So, um, sorry, to jump to, okay, so this is the area of Indonesia. So, as you see, a very huge territory and there's no door at all. Everyone could just get into Indonesia from you know, any direction. So this is very, you know, great burden to Indonesia how to secure our sea, how to bar that our law is not infringed by any vessel, you know, whether our own vessel or foreign vessel. As you know, um, you know, our Indonesian territory is actually having a bundle of resources, living or not resource, uh, living or not living, and then we are, you know, uh, loads of international obligation, and in that case, we are providing the international, uh, the CDA, agricultural CDA. So we need to go, uh, you know, every every road that has been uh, used by international obligation. And then, like 
national security by Russia previously, many of those things happening, not just piracy, but including human trafficking and recently destruction of coral reefs, also called labor at sea. Um, so I give you some example. So this is what uh, happening for the Arnold region. So many cases, so it's very small character. But to give you an example, there are a lot of you know, practices in uh, our global happening in the sea, which is actually our lands boundary. And then the Zina case, before that, sorry, it's a very sensitive case. <laughs> sorry, okay. Uh, and then we have drug trafficking. So, I know recently has been detained. You know, several professor, this is only that reported, you know, and available in media, but I think there's so many professor have been caught and detained because they are trying to have, you know, that parity between Indonesia and Malaysia, you know, all the other, the other way around. So this is something, um, a challenge for Indonesia. And then the Zina case, if you follow this case, it's talking about the first figure. Actually, this is Indonesian uh, foreign investment company. So it is owned by the beneficiary owner in Thailand. And they're trying to recruit you know, the, uh, the, the workers, the employee, from Myanmar, you know, from Laos, from Cambodia, and they are treated very badly as forced labor. And they simply also killed you know, in the middle of the sea. So this is a very landmark case. Uh, we are very shocked, you know, to learn that it's happening in our water, which is actually in our Antibody water, in Pacific Island in Benzina. So we've been trying to rectify the problem uh, together with Task Force 115. Not to mention because Mandela you know, just mentioned most of them just use Indonesia as a transit state. So they like to go to Australia through Indonesia. But this is the problem of Indonesia. How then we could, uh, if you know, we could prevent them to go to Australia, so what is the right of them to be, you know, stay in Indonesia, where they like to be our citizen or resident, or can we just send them back? Because Indonesia actually honoring the principle of non reformment so this is also the other. This is the role of the first monkey. So I give you an example of the fishing vessel you know, that has been detained and you know, sunk and bombed by Indonesia. One of them is piping, and then also um, the other you know, vessel, um, most of them are you know, Chinese fishing vessel. And this is the one who's, you know, who did that, so we call the Task Force 115, you know, has been formed by the nation government. And then uh, we've been trying to not just, you know, uh, execute them, but also to develop law in this service, uh, how then we could be there, you know, and then really uh, combat, eradicate these practices. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, the things have been done by Task Force 115. Uh, not just the domination of oper operational areas, but also monitoring operation, investigation of some disease crime, and then controlling uh, command center and also sinking and moving the legal fishing vessel. It has been uh, well, I think harvesting, you know, protests from various countries, especially those competing crimes. But uh, I could tell you that Indonesia, especially Minister Susi, has been uh, supported by quite many international community in doing that because it has been, uh, you know, suffering for a lot, you know, so many times because of the really thing done in our EZ particularly. So I, I, I like to uh, go to the regional challenge of Indonesia. So the challenge of many Indonesia is not just you know sitting in our archipelagic water and EZ, but also we need to go to fight further on, you know, to Indian Ocean. And as you know, we have what we call Ayala. Um, I'm not going to talk more about it. If you like to um, to look more of it, because I think uh, the slide will be there to refer to all of you. 
But then, uh, if you look the objective of Ayurveda, I know that we need to be very active in Ayurveda because Ayurveda also touch not just the security, but also how the physical support to be given. And then um, Indonesia and Ayurveda, uh, because Ayurveda also has identified priority areas, including maintenance security, threat and investment facilitation, risk management, disaster risk reduction. So this is very important for us, you know, to be actively involved in, in Ayurveda. And then um, Indonesia has been, um, you know, a chairman for this Ayurveda. And then we are successful in launching what we call Jakarta Comfort 2017 and Action Plan. So mind you that when we talk about the Jakarta Concord, um, there's a lot of things has been done. But uh, what I like to notice here, within the IRA Action Plan, there is an establishment of IRA Center of Excellence or Maritime Safety and Security. So um, I think this is a task for Indonesia to take a much bigger role because if you look at the map, the most, you know, the southern part of Indonesia is sitting in the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean also the most busiest road for international navigation, so we are obliged you know, actually to secure this area. And then um, the strategic issue on this, I think Indonesia now this is the challenge for the Indian Ocean to have uh, you know, to tackle the problems of the weak law enforcement such as in the of Eden, of course the Somalia has been spelled out, you know, before this. Um, and Indonesia actually uh, took one action, you know, to that. But I think this is the challenge to the Navy again, you know, how then we could be very active in securing the Indian Ocean. We don't want the third parties trying to come into the water of the Indian Ocean and trying to secure that. And then we, um, I would like to mention about the South China Sea problem that we have, you know. Uh, we have a problem with China in the South China Sea. But we are specifically don't, you know, um, acknowledge we we are we didn't, we didn't try to be to be you know, we, well, we've been trying to be honest with the, with China that they are uh, they're having a claim that have no legal basis at all. And then if we go directly to the PCA judgment, even though we are not the parties of the PCA, but we know perfectly that there's no legal basis for China to claim, you know, um, any traditional fishing ground in Natuna, which is, has been uh, claimed by Indonesia as our EZ. So this gives also a homework to Indonesian government, to Indonesian legal officers to be there from time to time to just chase away any, you know, any person, including Chinese using person, that trying to, I would say, steal in our water. So um, this problem, uh, not just uh, about the fisheries problem, but also we need to secure the South China Sea itself, because South China Sea is the road for international navigation, there is a seal of, you know, silence of communication, and I don't want, again, like in the Indian Ocean, to have the third party in the function in the South China Sea. If there shall be countries, God of South China Sea, it shall be the neighboring countries, which are most of the ASEAN countries. But of course, there is China, you know, dominating South China Sea. So, uh, this is the thing, uh, the thing that we have been done so far. So, we always, you know, um, uh, chase them away or uh, we defend them and then uh, we uh, prosecute uh, this Chinese fishing vessel. And then um, what we've been trying to do, uh, according to the Navy, I think Navy has been uh, doing just that, uh, to display peaceful of sovereignty in Natuna Sea. Because uh, if you are not there, it seems that you are abandoning the area. So we we need to be there. Um, and this is the strategic step. I think ASEAN needs to be a very bold 
um, step, which is very difficult, I think, because we need to be in consensus to achieve any agreement whatsoever. And then there are several countries in ASEAN who are opposed to that, if it's relating to China. So um, it's not very easy, but Indonesia needs to stand up all the time. In terms of Indonesian law, we have the most complete history score. We have a very good uh, you know, law on navigation, but then this is the term of how we could implement and enforce the law that has been adapted. I conclude here. I thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
for international navigation and then also other straight passes through archipelagic water and also hub port. Indonesia got 10 neighboring countries and we are not able yet to agree to conclude the maritime uh, delimitation. They still overlapping maritime zone and delimited maritime boundaries and then of course it caused issues. Uh, the panelists, other panelists already mentioned about maritime marine environment challenges concerning marine resources, overfishing, and then profitability tax IUPC, and also some fishermen using destructive fishing method. Of course, if there are many ships in marine environment, so it can cause pollution. And then the new issues concerning marine biosecurity as well. And then of course we are already aware the effect of global warming and marine natural disaster. This has visualization quite so traffic in the region in the last years. So density, so crowded, and then how to control that one. And then there is monitoring analysis illegal activities at sea within the Indonesia region. Uh, you can see it here, most of the illegal activities in the western part of Indonesia. The challenges already mentioned, I'm not touched upon again, already mentioned by Prof. Uh, there is 16 uh, crime species mentioned, identified by UN which is considered as transnational organized crime and then most of them can be happen at the sea. Uh, what is the legal limit? The legal limit back to the uh, middle era always competing between domination and also freedom. And also it's reflected in the law of the sea nowadays as well. And it's happened today as well. Which is the one part is sovereignty, not the practice, freedom of navigation, which is uh, which is uh, enveloped what we call basic right. What is military security? There are many type of crime at sea. Uh, I discussed with my colleague, it's seen that Every crime happened in life could be also happened at sea. But when it happened at sea, it's difficult because it's complex, it's dynamic, it's multi dimension, multi sector, multi stakeholder to, uh, to handle it and transnational in characters. So in C, we cannot only use national law to cope, to settle the issues. We have also considered the international law. This is for the security cross casting sectors, which is international, public and also private for securing pesticide, sea poultry, that's what we call use of the sea, and then the last, how to uh, secure what we call the border at sea. The element is security and stability, it's not just only national, regional, but also global. The sovereignty, territorial integrity, but also the political independence. And then we already mentioned what we call ceiling of commission. And then we have to consider the access line where the access line is. And then ship. What type of ship itself? Then what is the jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the coastal state? And then how about the crew? And then what, what, how we treat the reserve manager? Is it the same with the other crew? And then also the involvement of the owner. 
And the last element is what we call environment, which is how to preserve, how to protect, and how to conserve the environment. And that was that, that the last, the last element is the point in our ocean conference last week. Law enforcement is actually law enforcement is out. That's that's my personal uh, uh, table or opinion. Uh, based on interesting the experience, the fluctuated on legal processing by the sea. Uh, I just said with the, the, the experience, uh, which has happened last Saturday and then today is still in Malipa. Uh, we, we got information from the foreign affairs that there is uh, uh, MP is uh, coming through in this world. And then she will maybe go worship and then get the motor vessel is. But the flag is such is a real thing. Quote unquote is not not Korea, what we what we we call information before. The problem in here, the foreign affair, they got information from the US. And US mentioned to us that there is a UN Security Council issue that state cannot what we call uh, trade with the North Korea concerning the minerals there is a uh, five or six resolution and then what what in the Indonesia is going to do when we got such kind of information when we are private in the city everything okay the government is clear we 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 got problem then how to how to how to handle such kind of uh, uh, issues and then my aware as well that he is already you know appointed as a non parliament non parliament member of the UN Security Council as well and then how Indonesia uh, what do you call it enforce the resolution that Indonesia already get that's a that's a that's a difficult for me because already founded by Chief of Navy to 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 you know to lead the prosecution or to the investigation of the case. But fortunately what will be on board of the sea? The master sea lower the Sierra Leone flag and then they they hoist the North Korea flag and then we check it the document and then there is inconsistency and then that point which is against the national law and then we you know we we, we call the we call the legal legal uh imprisonment and then we we pray we discuss to the prosecutor and then we, we accept it and then now this already in a people court and we do hope that maybe actually there is there is a uh decision on on the suspension of this but the problem is the imprisonment is not considered how to say so the cargo and also the city. The one that US wanted. So that's gonna create another issue, but it's not in the scenario so anymore. That's why I'm so released. And then back to law enforcement, well we just uh, divided into actor, law and threat. The actor itself, maybe you already mentioned from Vietnam, there are many stakeholders. Those are stakeholders, they got to the reason based on Innocent law, the variety of law, actor of law, and then the law itself is got many, especially defense and military, and then also criminal law, and then transportation, and then installation for equipment. That's a, a just only few, there are many in fact. Uh, and also the threat is all, the threat itself is not just on the sector, but also national and also transnational. What we want, what we one the next time and uh, next maybe in the book is how to integrate maritime security system. And then in this case maybe we need a uh, system from the German concerning how to set up this kind of system. And then 
Um, that's the framework we call it the creative uh, framework, which is considered the national paradigm of the time. We call Muspawa um, Nusantara, and then now we have national modern policy. Uh, this Christian uh, Commission in 2017 and also Maritime Governance and also Regional Maritime Architecture and then integrated framework can be go to the good order at sea which is uh, you know related to the land infrastructure, Maritime Resource Management, Safety Security of Navigation and then how to control the sea in this case we need the uh, uh, satellite technology and then also it's expensive and then management environment and the last time we are talking about the jurisdiction jurisdiction on the law enforcement itself the territorial political and this is maritime um, law at the event concerning the, how to protect uh, national authority and then the last part we call regional cooperation on maritime security as I mentioned before uh, when we are talking about the time issue it seems that the most single country, single state can handle. Uh, like I said, uh, we got many experience, uh, safe flying flag of Malaysia, but the crew is Myanmar, Thailand, and then how to handle this kind of things, you know. Uh, uh, last week, uh, in our Como waters, there is a cargo ship flying Singaporean, Singaporean, high check. The crew, there is all Indonesian nationality. This kind of thing, you know, uh, uh, create a complexity handling uh, maritime issues. Final thought and recommendation. Final thought. Parliament student challenges is dominated by multi track factor. Regional corporate regional organization, state actor, non-state actor, market force, and also many rivals. What I also see is many challenges I mentioned before using examples. A uh, new approach is needed in order to maintain wealth and security. Recommendation, new strategic mechanisms, and also the important maritime stakeholder among countries. Uh, new strategic mechanism enhance regional cooperation improve risk assessment and reduction and also informal sharing is needed and also compliance in the national law within national law as I mentioned before it's critical for Indonesia to use UN's critical council resolution as a legal basis to handle or to get to get or to process the privilege what we call is. That's why we just use national law. Then we already discussed with Prokubata and maybe it's not even in, in, in uh, German, we call it dualism or uh, monoism concerning the adoption of international law within or into the national law. I think this is the end of my presentation. Uh, I would quite happy to share or to have a uh, comment and question after this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, we still have several minutes for discussion because I understand because some of them need to go to the airport at uh, 11.30. So we approximately have about 15 minutes for q and uh, some of from the presentation of the three speakers, I think uh, interesting to see the case of regional organizations. The case of EU, EU seems to provide a way out for member states to deal with some of the challenges uh, at sea. But uh, from the presentation of Professor Montoro, I have a sense that sometimes actually regional organizations cause some uh, prohibit uh, more cooperation. Uh, in dealing with uh, challenges at uh, maritime, uh, our maritime security. That's, uh, I think, a very interesting case to look deeper to, but uh, now I leave it to the floor. If you have questions and comments to our three distinguished speakers in the front. Please, uh, I'd like to open one or two uh, questions. Anyone? Uh, 
Mr. Pauls and uh, another one, Professor Asinjaro, and one at the back. Please be brief, because we only have this to three very detailed uh, presentations on law issues. I ask myself the question, where is the guy who has the, the, who cut the golden nuts that are in these things? I mean, we have, we have a tendency to make things more complicated, at least for somebody who is not a lawyer, and every threat are uh, as clear as they can be seen, who is going to try to make it simpler to come to fighting those elements? I mean, I have been very much astonished how many details in each, be it in the vision, be it in is in there, and where the limitations are. Is there also a, a, a headline to run success in fighting all these elements? Thank you. That's the parallel of democracy. Please pass it for such a Oh, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be here this morning. They remind me of my experience uh, when I was ambassador to Germany in 1990 to 93. There are two points that are interesting for me to follow and I have to ask questions. How do we compare the management of semi and close seas in Germany and in Tunisia? Germany is facing Baltic Sea, there's a semi and close seas, and Indonesia is facing five semi and close seas like Andaman Sea, South China Sea, Celebes Sea, Arakura Sea, Timor Sea, and so forth. Can we compare the management of the two kind of experiences which we may or can learn from each other? The second point is Indonesia and Germany is facing similar problems with straight use for international navigation. In Indonesia, it is Strait of Malacca and Singapore, basically. In Germany, it is Chagra Straits, basically, getting out from the Baltic Sea to the uh, ocean. How can we compare of the management of the two uh, straits used for international navigation. <coughs> what can be learned from each other on those experiences? That's what I would like to hear, also basically of course. Of course there are so many other things that we can talk about, but the two things are directly concerned in Indonesia and Germany uh, in my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, please, please be brief and identify yourself. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sensei, for writing down Dr. Professor Mandaro. Then I have uh, two questions. One, who is the effect of the coordination, particularly in Malaysia, which uh, operational analysis approach and budget approach? And the second, what is the evaluation together in April policy and application uh, studies in Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore? Thank you. Uh, that means it's 
is the time to uh, discuss this kind of uh, privacy and international uh, issues in a separate body rather than really to be respected to the local uh, maritime laws. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite the two speakers. Uh, you can choose any of the questions uh, or you can answer all the questions, but please give yourself free in each because uh, we are near the end of the session. Would like to start first, back to Abdul uh, thank you for the response. And then I think the um, gentleman from the Old Man Defense University, and then who is the coordinator? Uh, uh, let me look in the background why we, we need something for region in Susi. The fact that we go, you know, uh, at NSP instead of Malata is quite aware. And then when something happened in celibacy and Susi, and we try to portray it, we try to uh, copy and pass the system in a state of Malata into the Susi. But the problem is not so easy. Uh, the three ministry, ministry of the level, uh, which is uh, the ministry and also the foreign ministry already made it with the three countries, and then we already decided on uh, the system. But the problem is here when we are uh, already in the in the technical operation level, for example, to define the area of region, it's it's it's. Uh, difficult, it's difficult. And then that's why when we are talking about who is in the cold region, the cold region this time is still in the ministry, the ministry and also foreign affairs. We haven't go to the detail. Already established in the information sharing center between the three countries, Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia. Uh, I think that's what we have as well, but this is only in the uh, information sharing. And then, I think, uh, I think that's all I think about the call. I think we can discuss, we can set up a discussion in the input part and we can discuss later because in the top time. And then, uh, the issue that you raised from Chawai in Java is quite interesting. Uh, we have to differentiate between the, the area of the semi in OC itself and also the split which is uh, related to the body of the water. Uh, like Professor Hassan Asim Jalal said, uh, there is a new uh, trans uh, basis right, what we call uh, transit basis right, which is uh, excluded or it's uh, operated in the state use for international litigation. The problem is the, it, the right is out. Is different with the innocent basic right or different with the uh, archaeology basic right when we are talking about the basics. But when we are talking about the body water, what we call sending in to sea, there's many what we call a rule to, to regulate the sending in to sea. For example, the littoral states have to cooperate to control pollution, environment, and also the resources itself. But it seems there is no such kind of cooperation. It is in a sort of uh, South China Sea, in a Sulu Sea, even in Arapuro and also Timosi. Some uh, scholars say that when we are talking about the same sea, it's sea which is consists of many countries, many, many states. But how about the Arab Sea? How about the thing was the village that belongs to Indonesia? And that's difficult as well. When we are talking about burden sharing, burden sharing already mentioned in Article 43 of the Sea Convention. But burden sharing is not come to the boundary. It's like a binding uh, co region. But until now, in Sri of Malata, there is no such kind of correlation uh, in terms of the interpretation of uh, implementation of Article 43 of the Law of the Sea itself. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, well, actually, the confusion is ours. So, we, we are so confused 
because uh, you know, our water has been used uh, for many, many you know, uh, kind of acts, you know, acts. So many kinds happening at sea. And uh, every day, you know, in our time, we have always been shocked, you know, there's another one, you know, criminal action happening in our sea. But again, you know, this is something that we've been trying to address from time to time. And looking at the, how many, you know, law enforcers in Indonesia, you know, the things become, uh, you know, very much complicated, you know. But then, um, now, um, our national, our national uh, agency for national planning, uh, here we call it Babanas, you know, they have been trying to uh, really to make uh, every institution and the market to enforce or see to sit together and to really, you know, uh, formulate what, what are the strategies and then what are the government roles is pointing up, you know, to do enforcement and see. So uh, I'm happy to let you know that uh, some, you know, the academician and, and uh, Marcus Mayer has been also involved in that. Now uh, there is a, a strong intention to establish what we call the Data Center of Maritime Security Surveillance and Law Enforcement. Really, uh, Stella and I, you know, we just thought about how important to use the technology. So this is the very intention of the Bapanas, you know the National Planning Agency to uh, really have a very high technology in this uh, center, in this data center, and then uh, by, by having that, we not then obliged to deploy more of 1,000 pesos at sea because we can afford that, right? So um, maybe by having these and this integrated in Bakala, the Maritime Security Agency, as Actually, this is uh, a method given by our law, law on the ring. So maybe uh, in the end we could have a very, you know, uh, kind of clear, you know, uh, direction way to go. Because uh, if we have these, and then we will, we will ask every agency that has uh, the method to enforce uh, law and see we get together, you know, in a very strong coordination by Mr. Um so uh, I think that's uh, one, one of the things uh, we like to do. Uh, and about the same course, I think, you know, uh, Hasi, my father, always told, told us uh, from time to time, how about that, you know, are, are we uh, doing something on that? As far as I know, uh, in Arapura City, there is a collaboration between uh, Indonesian government, Timor-Leste, State, Australia, and Papua New Guinea. Uh, they have been collaborating work, uh, you know, quite uh, quite many years, and a lot of investment has been given, you know, particularly from Australia, because of course uh, they have a lot of money. Uh, but I don't think it's uh, only sort of problem uh, to rule me. But at least they they uh, implement what Uto says, you know. Uh, all the little states uh, get together and try to manage the area, you know, uh, you know in, in a very good collaboration. Uh, for the state is what I think for international relations is, uh, in, in our case, uh, Classic Passage Ride, uh, where, well, it's assisting in the of Malacca. I know the collaboration between the three countries, you know, has been done. Uh, Massimo and Eisenstein and you know, all of that. Uh, but we, we still need to look at other problems besides just piracy. You know? Because it seems that piracy and Siano be just a pioneer, you know, pioneer case you know, happening in Central America, but actually uh, against Sarah, you know, I, I don't think that there's a lot of money environment uh, problems happening in Central America, you know, the slash or will they just, you know, uh, intentionally down to the sea in our border happening because, uh, you know, our you know, our neighbors in Singapore just uh, let them, you know, all the faster we do that. So, um, again, what was said that these little states need to get together and, of course, the freedom of navigation is regarded, but the little state can have rules, you know, and law how to you know, to prevent uh, the, the destruction uh, and pollution to happen.
So um, I think uh, we've been doing just that, but it's not enough. So I, I'm, I came to see what happened in German uh, practices. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll be brief. Uh, what can I make simpler? I think international law is very simple on these questions. Uh, the complications result from domestic law, and so a solution would be legislation, and legislation requires political will. So it's a question of political will to make things simpler. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your two questions, I think, which are very important and head on. Uh, something we, unfortunately, must say we haven't addressed neither yesterday nor today, so you hit the nail on its head. Um, with regard to studying those seas, I think uh, there would be a lot to offer from the German side because, of course, we have a lot of experience both with regard to Baltic, but indirectly also in the Mediterranean, very involved through the European Union. And I think here we have a comprehensive treaty regime in both sending those seas with regard, for example, to the protection of the marine environment. In the Baltic Sea, the riparian states have regulated basically everything from oil pollution to marine protected areas to the disposal of platforms. Uh, there is a lot of international legislation in that area, and all the riparian states have been cooperating since the 1970s. So there is a lot, a lot of material to look to, but again, I would say what is required is the political will. Uh, unless there is political will here in Southeast Asia between the countries to cooperate, uh, not much will happen with regard to uh, the semi-closed seas. Um, with regard to straits, um, again, I think uh, we have a long history. Um, the uh, straits of Skagra, for example, was mentioned for the first time uh, in the treaties of Munster and Osnabrück in 1648. So we have a very long tradition of regulating the freedom of navigation through these streets, which predate Ancos by several hundred years. Uh, again, so we have had experience in that area, but of course, today I would say we have a universally recognized regime for straits, uh, which can be applied independently of any particular uh, regional peculiarity. So I think there's not much to learn, but the international regime is to be applied to these trades here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I saw two fingers in the question. Uh, please, Mr. Berger. One minute. I think it comes up to the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. And I just uh, would like to react briefly to the former Indonesian ambassador to Germany's uh, request for what can we do to intensify the cooperation. And my point is simply that uh, this very good meeting today is a starting point or able to be a starting point to facilitate the process. What we lack, at least on our German side here, is simply maritime expertise. Uh, look at our backgrounds, you will see what I mean. What we have in Germany is the German Maritime Institute, headed by Vice Admiral Schwinger, by the way, the former uh, Deputy Chief of Staff, Sekti NATO, who, who has a good overview about the civilian and the military dimension of what we are talking about. And we have that institute in Kiel, I'm the receiver fellow. So, we could try, if there is a serious uh, desire for that, to, to have a follow-up uh, meeting amongst maritime experts from both the civilian versions side and the German Navy to, to promote these issues and to exchange the views or compare notes that we said at the beginning. Uh, but that's what we can offer, what I could offer in theory. And, uh, 
We have that we tomorrow on Wednesday uh, the annual meeting of the Maritime Convention, so where I can raise it as an issue. I'm not very sure how far it is known already, what, what this year the intent, but I can also these the services. Thank you, Mr. Zonda. I think that's a um, very good idea and uh, I hope that it will up. Now please join me and give a round of applause to our speakers. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I just a short housekeeping announcement, uh, but I'd like to take the floor with the next agenda. We are serving tea, coffee, and also snacks outside of the auditorium. However, please note not to bring those refreshments inside the auditorium. You are welcome to enjoy the refreshments at any time during the sessions of the event. We will now be commencing to our second panel entitled The Nexus Between Technological Innovation, Cybersecurity and Maritime Security. May I invite all the panelists for the second panel to take their place on the stage and I give the stage now to the moderator. Thank you. 
things about uh, the nexus between uh, maritime security and uh, technological innovations and uh, cyber security. Uh, I would like to uh, focus uh, my uh, presentations uh, specifically on uh, specifically on uh, technology for the industry of China. I would like to focus my presentation specifically on the general trends relating uh, to recent technology for the industry of uh, development in the uh, of maritime ground. So it's not a good for the other uh, speakers in this panel about the uh, subject that we are going to talk about. Uh, okay, uh, to begin, I would like to highlight several uh, uh, key points that we, when, when we are talking about the uh, recent developments in NAPO uh, and, and the recent development uh, security. Uh, we, first of all, we have to uh, take notes about the recent uh, challenges with regard to the maritime security. First, I think uh, if we look at uh, latest developments, I mean, when you're speaking about threats, uh, I think, of course, uh, we can define uh, maritime security threats into two technical uh, general categories. The first is uh, we will observe, we will observe, we will observe uh, symmetric and asymmetric threats. Uh, when we are talking about symmetric threats, of course we are talking about the high intensity conflict uh, that involves, uh, for example, engagement between uh, navies. Uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, asymmetric threats, of course uh, we are going to uh, cope with uh, threats uh, like that involve uh, the use of parliamentary, uh, parliamentary uh, forces or proxies uh, tracks. That way, I mean, the nature of conflict that we are that talking about is, uh, is relatively low, or we call it it's a low intensity conflict. Uh, second aspect of the recent uh, uh, maritime uh, landscape development, I think. Uh, if, uh, the nature of capability is that uh, navies or uh, maritime forces in the world are developing today. The first, of course, we can divide it uh, into uh, several general uh, categories. Because I think when we're talking about the capability that we need to uh, tackle down or deal with the uh, maritime security threats, of course, uh, we need uh, to have a robust that way, uh, that's, uh, that said, that you need to have a variety of surveillance capabilities. Uh, it can be a postal based radar or involve uh, aerial reconnaissance and surveillance. Uh, aside of developing robust uh, maritime human awareness, uh, states or countries uh, need to develop capabilities to uh, enforce their sovereignty uh, or to, uh, to engage threats, uh, whether it's uh, asymmetric or asymmetric, in a way that uh, you can effectively deal with problems uh, on the ground. Uh, I think uh, when you're talking about the uh, level engagement, uh, the type of capabilities that can be developed is to have a sea control. That the first, the second one is to have a uh, power projection, and the last one is the sea denial. Sea control, I mean, for uh, actually the countries like uh, Indonesia, I think uh, we are uh, familiar with the uh, littoral uh, operation, but for uh, sea going uh, countries, uh, major maritime trading uh, nations like Japan, China, uh, European countries, and even the US, they are more. Uh, going to uh, power projection of it is that involves uh, not only amphibious uh, operation but also carrier uh, battle groups. And, uh, the, and the third capabilities that uh, navies are uh, developing today is the sea 
denial probabilities. It has been, uh, I mean, this type of probability tends to focus more on the undersea warfare that involves anti-access uh, technologies like uh, uh, submarine warfare and mine warfare and so on. I think that's, that's the general uh, overview on the recent uh, maritime uh, on, or now developments uh, globally and regionally. Looking at that particular uh, uh, operations and uh, challenges that navies are facing today, I think uh, I think it is very relevant uh, for us to discuss about the recent uh, industrial development, uh, especially the NAPAS development uh, globally and regionally. I think I would like to focus. Uh, in, uh, I would like to focus more on the. Uh, in the Indo Pacific, I think uh, since thousands or even earlier, I think uh, the policy communities and academic communities have observed uh, the remarkable uh, growth of China's uh, naval uh, shipbuilding, especially since thousands. Uh, with an industrial base centered on several uh, major shipyards, uh, China uh, has been engaged in considerable sales, production of large and small surface weapons. In the subsurface uh, arena, for example, the production of the total of uh, 38 new units including ballistic missile submarines is also significant. In terms of submarine, destroyer, pickup, and corporate production, China has either exceeded or nearly this or nearly much uh, the collective outputs uh, production of the next three principal regional navies of uh, Japan, Korea, and India. China also produced nine new underway replacement vessels and it has launched the first time home built uh, aircraft carrier and first modern cruiser. They, uh, procurement fills two major capital gaps in the Chinese Navy. On the part of the US, I think uh, the US Navy has procured uh, more uh, carriers, uh, as much as three units, and nuclear attack submarines, destroyers, and large amphibious uh, ships than China, but not as many small surface submarines. There are still uh, uncertainties uh, over. Uh, how robust Chinese warship designs and relative to their uh, competitors as well as their system integration and weapon performance. The critical issue today is whether China's ability, whether China is able to sustain this level of output and address weaknesses such as submarine design and amphibious uh, capacity. We are talking about uh, amphibious uh, operations. So I think in the past few years there has been considerable progress in the amphibious of uh, in the amphibious capability arena with the navy. Uh, I mean, uh, with the main with the major power of the country are procuring and uh, moving towards towards uh, towards uh, the procurement of a landing ship designed to deliver uh, equipment offer to the beach to a model centered on the large and previous ships able to stand offshore and project force via landing craft and helicopters. This is uh, some you know, infographics that, uh, that uh, we can uh, that, that uh, our research at CSIS have been uh, made uh, in, in the past few months that actually uh, there are uh, I mean uh, of course from this map, I think the U.S. remains the leading uh, country that can uh, that have the ability to procure and produce uh, uh, large size ambiguous uh, vessels. But uh, countries in Europe and some countries in, in, in Asia are also making the same uh, progress to get up with U.S. Uh, capabilities. I think uh, this map also tells us that uh, there are uh, shortcomings. Uh, on the on that capabilities for Asia. I think uh, 
uh, Russia, uh, the plans to procure amphibious uh, vessels have been hindered significantly with this cancellation, uh, or with the cancellation of uh, contact uh, for two French uh, mistral amphibious ships. However, recent uh, reports and recent uh, research undertaken by, by academicians uh, suggest that development of similar uh, large amphibious uh, ship designs is underway uh, in Russia. Uh, in the first slide, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I highlighted uh, the need for uh, power production, and one of the capabilities for uh, power production is to is, is, uh, involve uh, land attack, uh, the use of land attack cruise missiles. Uh, some uh, needs in the uh, in the world, I think, uh, particularly the US, have been procuring. Uh, and have been operationalized uh, land attack cruise missiles, but uh, a number of other states have also sought to acquire resistance strike capability from sea. Russia, for example, recently developed a caliber uh, uh, type uh, land attack cruise missiles uh, that uh, we saw the, for the first time uh, the capability is used in October 2015, when four ships of the Caspian flotilla attacked targets in Syria. Although Russia uh, plans to equip more of these ships with, uh, with that capability, the U.S. will remain uh, uh, to continue to uh, operate by far uh, the most uh, platforms with the uh, land attack of Russia capability. Some states also developing uh, their own capability or planning to acquire existing project. Take a look at uh, France with their missile, the Sporadoa, Naval, and Sparada uh, class of uh, And take a look at also uh, India, where it plays a submarine launch uh, version of its Brahmos missiles, which is currently fit onto several press vessels. When the, okay, uh, I'm moving to another slide. Uh, when we discuss about the uh, undersea warfare, of course, the, uh, the first come into mind uh, is the submarine capability. The, if you look at the recent trends, the global submarine market has been substantially since the end of World War. The total number of vessels has remained largely constant, with uh, 41 steps of red service of submarine in 1990, while 40 did not did so in the end of 20, uh, 2014. But this belief relies a shift in professional submarine operators away from Europe, from Europe uh, during uh, World War towards Asia in the Middle uh, and the Middle East. Similarly, as the number of steps with uh, nuclear power submarines has also uh, fluctuated between 5 and 6 over the years, depending on how India's number inventory, uh, but the number of nuclear power submarines has fallen sharply as a form of war. Uh, fleets in Russia and US has been reduced. Are other areas of drought on uh, technological drought have been air dependent proportion submarines and possible immediate submarines as countries such as North Korea and Iran develop a more affordable submarine capability. Uh, uh, let's move to uh, when we talk uh, aside of the submarine uh, capability of uh, navies also procured recently uh, another ca uh, capability to undertake uh, undersea warfare. Uh, the, the first is, uh, I mean, uh, this kind of, the, the next uh, type of capability for undersea warfare is uh, the procurement of uh, anti-submarine uh, fixed-wing aircraft by some navies in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, at the end of World War, however, uh, there are the decline of fixed wing. The, uh, the, there are uh, there were a decline in fixed wing and bomb and by submarine warfare efforts. However, the proliferation of modern submarine capabilities, particularly in Asia, and the resurgence of submarine uh, active, uh, Russian submarine activity, has revived the interest in uh, in fixed wing and by uh, submarine uh, aircraft. As countries weigh future requirements, other options like the unmanned uh, system may become available by the risk 
is that many countries may simply lose this high-end capability. Uh, when you're talking about uh, use of unmanned aerial vehicle, I think in recent years, uh, armed uh, UAVs have proliferated despite the US efforts within themselves uh, to other countries. Uh, domestic uh, developments and imports have provided an uh, increasing number of countries with the ability to operate not to operate uh, to, uh, to operate uh, a weapon system. The US however has so far pursued a process approach to the export of armed systems while China has been less strained. Uh, Israel, uh, when we're looking at this map, is actually quite, uh, has become one uh, alternative uh, source for a variety of uh, onion area of the but as yet there are no identified export of such system for Israel as uh, widely export uh, intelligence surveillance and coordination UAVs. I think this type of capabilities are taking uh, 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 global procurement uh, trends. I think uh, this, if uh, countries, if a regional country deploys uh, and offers operates this type of capabilities into their uh, into their maritime domain, I think that will be uh, that will somehow it will uh, uh, create uh, uncertainties. Uh, but also at the same time, it also change. They might change the balance of power in the region. Uh, with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for an uh, excellent presentation. Um, um, uh, now I call on uh, I to provide presentation on cybersecurity in a number of countries. Thank you very much. Hello, for my nice introduction. Uh, 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 um, I will hurry through the cyber security in a couple of minutes. Uh, for those of you who uh, are not interested in all that, actually, I'm just uh, preparing for vacation, so you can ask me uh, to share with you. Uh, uh, cyber security in the naval domain, and actually, uh, I touched upon that uh, in spring uh, 2013. Uh, I received an invitation from the US uh, Naval Forces from Africa that were preparing for African contingencies uh, uh, and were eagerly trying to get forward, uh, getting crews prepared, uh, getting tools prepared, getting doctrine fixed uh, on site operations uh, in the Mediterranean with uh, regard to uh, African contingencies. Uh, I found that kind of striking because uh, actually cyber for a long time had been a kind of money burner, so you could come to conferences, talk about it, but nobody would make any money with it. Uh, and uh, actually, I think it started in 2013 that um, the cyber became a money maker. Uh, and I think, uh, in my assessment, uh, the, the revival was that the, the US had learned that they uh, cannot only be beneficiary of cyber operations, but they can also become victim cyber operations, and this was a kind of driving factor that altered uh, the international cyber scene, and so let me see how we get uh, to this issue. What I want to provide you is context, uh, because the uh, NATO issue has uh, talked about how uh, NATO and EU are uh, driving the issue of the, uh, the challenge that we have and a couple of recommendations. You, you know the gentleman, uh, what is uh, more important uh, are the two documents you see there, uh, that there is a new US and national, uh, national and also a new, new cyber uh, strategy uh, this year. And uh, in fact, we have learned uh, at least in Europe that once you have US strategies and concepts, uh, soon we will discuss the same on the European uh, environment as well, actually in the international environment. And you will soon see delegates uh, apply for our uh, situation. So, what it tells us, there is a new wave uh, of uh, cyber activity coming to us, uh, conceptually starting uh, going uh, down uh, to uh, deliveries. Uh, I think this is kind of important because uh, we touched upon uh, some of these issues. Obviously, we are in the connected risks, and uh, you see uh, uh, Putin on the left, the uh, lower corner. Uh, in fact, I think uh, if 
anything really changed our attitude for this issue was not Estonia decided, the Russian decided to act on, on Estonia in 2007, it was not uh, the cyber and warfare towards Georgia in 2008, it was uh, the Ukraine experience actually, uh, the civil agreement more or less that uh, represented hybrid uh, warfare, so it was a uh, uh, high uh, cyber content in it, and suddenly we got struck because we didn't expect it, uh, we were completely unaware of the situation and we were really struck about the, I think, all those conceptual operations that were uh, among that and that uh, related to impressive capabilities that keep impressing us until today. Along with the connected uh, risks, um, did you uh, have to look at the, the, the connected technologies? I, I think, for example, in the naval domain, when you look at that, um, you see uh, a lot of autonomous uh, uh, sensors, radars, all kinds of things uh, that, in principle, exploit data. Uh, and uh, how do they do it? Through cyber means. So, means in principle, every, every new invention and a new technology you introduce, in principle, increases opportunities uh, via cyber and increases your, increases your vulnerabilities. Uh, the, the cyber, and um, this is something where we have to really look at. Yeah. I've, I've noted today in, in some of the discussions that uh, land, sea, and air actually are domains uh, that you hear in Indonesia look very much upon. I would not connect it from space and cyberspace, so I would look at all these five domains actually, because what you see today that is that you cannot separate it from each other. Any ship that sails needs space. Uh, for, 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 uh, for timing, uh, for position, uh, for, for all kinds of things. Uh, cyber is uh, in any new technologies we get from uh, ships, uh, and um, dealing with these uh, domains in a comprehensive format is the only way that allows you in a professional manner to deal with that respectively. Center of gravity. Uh, one aspect uh, mostly overlooked, uh, the kind of thing worldwide, uh, is actually that the military-related issues, so particularly the naval-related issues with the government's things, uh, are one piece of the game, or two pieces of the game. Uh, the hybrid warfare that we are dealing with, the hybrid threats that we are dealing with, uh, and 70% of hybrid threats on cyber are more, mostly dealt with the civil domain. And this is a problem to us as, as we military are more or less uh, uh, well educated, trained to deal with operational issues, uh, although we are not well trained in cyber uh, domain yet. Uh, but we are at least uh, uh, used uh, to deal with these issues. Those who actually are sitting in the driving seats, the civil authorities, have more or less no room. Of course, there are exceptions, but uh, now coming up with these uh, uh, issues, uh, dealing with this increasing hybrid and cyber related issues, we need uh, civil leaders understanding conceptually in practice uh, what is going on and how to deal with it and how to steer and, and uh, deal with these operations. So, from there, I think this is an important point to look now, coming to naval cyber. There are a couple of things that are special about naval cyber. One, for example, is to mention this, uh, uh, how long ships sail, uh, how they are fixed to hardware, and how this hardware offers the vulnerabilities as a related software. We had that as a US cyber fleets that were uh, stuck uh, to Windows XP while all the vulnerabilities of Windows XP were known to the world of hackers, and they have continued because of security reasons uh, to use the software. In principle, this is a permanent thing when uh, those ships sailing around, uh, they are stuck with uh, their old hardware, they cannot update the, the software prospectively as it uh, would be needed, and uh, offenders, competitors, no problem. And uh, I recall a year ago, when I was actually speaking to the NATO's Maritime Command, uh, a couple of, uh, several times a couple of US ships were bumping into each other. Uh, and it wasn't really sure for some time whether this came from a kind of deviation from the GPS signal. So, uh, and uh, it was not, in the end, it was a uh, lack of training. 
But uh, the worry is something was to be, in fact, uh, somebody who is doing as it were, uh, the, the, the GPS the signals uh, and leading ships to each other. So uh, we had a kind of uh, interesting uh, situation that we had here when we then looked at the maritime domain and all the issues that are addressed, the forces, uh, infrastructure, the industry base, supply chains, command control, industrial logistics, personnel. You can see uh, that there is uh, a lot, uh, a lot of the main uh, domain that you need to look at and we have to look at the side aspects. And uh, here we have an observation from our own government in Germany, where the deputy minister uh, was a real expert in cyber, uh, and she was an expert on the cyber. So she had uh, dealt with bank problems and other things. And uh, I know that uh, during the time she was in government, she had no particular interest in the operational aspects of the cyber issue. Why she was fixing uh, the, the other issues, the more, let's say, opposite side of issues uh, and industrial side of issues uh, very intensively, uh, those kinds of aspects uh, dealing with intelligence surveillance, with reconnaissance and related cyber problems were not really at the core of her heart. And, and I think this is a kind of uh, problem to deal with the armed forces, in particular also with uh, naval forces. Uh, uh, that uh, people feel comfortable in their operational environment that they have. Uh, they look at cyber as something that is not directly, that they are not directly protected of, and so it's not part of your doctrine, part of the tools. And uh, I was really struck uh, when I was at the Naval Maritime Command last year, uh, the situation was worse than I thought. When I, when I talk about the people, so what do we have in plans in terms of the careers and tools and capabilities? Uh, this was zero. Of course, I have to exclude uh, a couple of forces, US forces, to uh, degree British forces, but it looks not very promising. So, so you see what I'm saying is uh, cyber is a kind of office cyber threat. It's well understood by many. Uh, cyber is an operational uh, threat to armed forces and armed services. Is uh, understood uh, much, much less. And when you look at the naval direction, uh, the going calls autonomous platforms, in particular, and all the fancy cyber uh, fancy technologies we are going to bring along with, you can just smell uh, that uh, uh, cyber uh, issues, cyber vulnerabilities, will increase dramatically. So, this is not a time we uh, just think about what we should do. It's, it's a time where you ask them who have thought of who should try to act and get to that forward. Actors, actors, uh, I won't go into detail, but in principle, we have all kinds of actors from criminal actors to intelligence actors to operational actors. Uh, and uh, the vectors that uh, they move in is the one classical thing that we have inside us. This nice person that puts us into a speed stick, into a tiny system on board your ship, uh, may cause exactly the problems uh, that you will find afterwards. And problems are related to denial of service, just to get the uh, system of the ship out of service, uh, to uh, jamming uh, systems uh, you know, uh, dependent on, on communication, obviously, to spoofing, which is, I think, even more straight to providing you false information uh, upon uh, that you then act respectively. And uh, what they do is they follow, uh, follow this kind of cyber uh, uh, kill chain that we have to get uh, into as an event and that we can apply that we actually act uh, on a kind of uh, 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 operation issue. Uh, the commander of the uh, Maritime Naval Maritime Command is actually mentioned already a couple of years ago that time is critical uh, and uh, I think this uh, this uh, understanding has not uh, really uh, really changed until today. I have not seen this change. When you really look at recent uh, NATO initiatives, uh, we have some months in, in, in uh, the cyber uh, command, the strategic cyber command of NATO that is supposed to become operational in 2023. All fully operational, so you see some time ago, it will go, and it doesn't solve the problem of the technical operation issues, because uh, what are you doing on your ship? If your ship doesn't perform as you want to do it, what is the personnel that is able to do with it? 
the, what kind of instruments and tools are you using to apply in conversation of all sophisticated uh, uh, moments. So you see uh, there's uh, uh, actually, I think even the, the US are worried at this point that they are not first in this uh, business any longer, but that they are lagging behind the Russian and Chinese capabilities, and this tells us that uh, we should have a sense of urgency uh, in getting our performance and our act better. Of course, uh, NATO is uh, engaged since, uh, since a long time. Um, uh, and, uh, as I mentioned, 2007 to 2008, this is only in Georgia. Uh, there have been a couple of summits that dealt with the issues. We have been driving policy. Amazingly, and uh, I find also embarrassing to be um, we thought that the defense is more important than the offense. So, from us coming from the event of Charles, uh, not understanding the, uh, the connection between defense and offense uh, is, is exclusively. I just cannot understand that this has been official politics now for so many years. So I think that we have just uh, have started to learn that this is not a good position. So, you can see it in Germany. In NATO, that the offensive leg now has to be established as well. The law that is not following us uh, in suit, <laughs> the law tells us what is not possible. Uh, uh, we actually need uh, rather law support in this part on uh, how we uh, can justify what we need to do. I think there is some gross potential in that, in that area. Uh, anyhow, what I think is remarkable in the kind of revolution, uh, European Union and uh, NATO are acting together, which they have not for the AIDS actually. So I think they are on hybrid uh, risks and, and also on uh, resilience issues. Uh, uh, they uh, come together with uh, some uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, so I think there is uh, still a little growth potential. But this is promising, as I mentioned before, uh, as uh, this is not a military issue, not a pure naval issue. It's a, it's a comprehensive or government issue and so that we need to look at what NATO capabilities contribute to it. Uh, going forward, it's now getting the principle of, uh, as you can see, the protection right and getting all of uh, the, uh, uh, the action part of it, the right uh, uh, based on, uh, on, on defensive measures, so we in principle try to get into the uh, kill chain of your own component, but also to develop uh, policy doctrine tools on the, uh, on the offensive side. Yeah. And to do that well, we need uh, maritime main awareness and includes this other instrument. I think this is one of the uh, really important things uh, that so we will have a comprehensive view of what needs to be done. And all of this uh, is uh, to, in particular, deal with the same of the game and the access every night that you have given results. Uh, a couple of issues how we can uh, look, look and need to deal with that is uh, that you have to organize it, that you have to protect your networks, etc. I have uh, followed by a couple of recommendations uh, uh, that uh, go uh, the starting principle from develop policy guidance, uh, go through uh, more technical concept tools, training. Uh, expertise and all of position uh, in principle you have to work the whole chain to be become uh, respectfully professional dealing with the side of the domain. Uh, I think that these uh, these are ways uh, that are uh, recommendations that would be of uh, interest for you here uh, as well. Uh, at least we have to take them uh, to our heart and to our action uh, to become uh, sufficiently side of very efficient uh, the neighbor domain and Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we, we, we've heard about how the strategy and innovation in the industry has been happening in the hardware and the software. And we understand there's so much lagging behind the media. But I think there's some parts of the media that we need to hear in some sort of technology. Uh, 
I always consider myself a storyteller. I'm sure I have a good storyteller, but I hate to be here standing between and the lines. So I try to be uh, as best as possible in the story of my paper. Um, as you know, that uh, Indonesia, uh, in an archipelagic country, facing a very large task to secure its territory and also. Uh, Lots of things that we need to consider hasn't been uh, able to be executed for some reasons. And I would like to uh, emphasize on that, uh, that the, inten the intention is that is this the capacity to execute that, that uh, we have not been able to achieve. Yeah. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, so, um, and this is one of the, well, uh, one of uh, the largest uh, Navy in Southeast Asia, you can say. And we have exposed approximately 65,000 uh, personal Navy and Marines online, and 235 surface vessels and subsurface ships, along with other inventories, uh, fixed wing and other wings, and uh, etc. Um, but we are facing a great uh, geographical uh, impediments and challenges. Um, the Navy are demanded not only capable of defending coastal areas, but also we need to have a limited, at least limited for uh, protection to ensure sovereignty of the internal waters and our EDC remains uncontested. And we have sea lines of communications that capture our archipelago. So we need to be able to harmonize that only our own national interest to secure our own country and to, have a, and to make sure that we have our national unity, unity but also um, how to harmonize that with international community's interest for the rights of innocent persons. And um, therefore it's not only for the interest of Indonesia actually to have a good and well-built community, but it's also for the interest of the international community. Um, people in 2003 said that a country that is spread over a large number of islands and encompassing a large sea area lacks the necessary physical concentrations, which often has adverse effects on the development of sea power. And here I assume that this holds very true for Indonesia. <coughs> And uh, this, unfortunately, that we are, that's something that we need to constantly face. And here I was asked to uh, talk about how Indonesia undergo its uh, level transformation. And um, let me explain the methods uh, used to uh, write my paper. I didn't really look at the organizational changes because it creates a very, very specific uh, competency to do that. Instead, I'm looking at what has changes uh, in terms of technology acquisition, in terms of military deployment, and also in terms of conceptual issues or doctrines. And I will argue that Although in the past five years, Indonesia have had some changes, but we need to look at transformation in very, you know, in long periods, because that also what happened with other Navy. So I would say that Indonesia has had its transformation, but uh, it's, uh, we don't have enough time to judge whether it has achieved substantial progress or not. Okay, thanks. Um, device automation, uh, when we refer to the definition by uh, Kathy Nevich, she said that it is a, a systematic process for applying new technology to military systems combined with a professional concept and adaptation of innovative organization that fundamentally changed the character and methods of country. And we see how this being implemented in navies around the world. Uh, for example, we see uh, evolutions of China, Chinese Navy, from the water to the water, maybe we see 
uh, Australia uh, with uh, very time was very good. We see Singapore changing from a humble baby into a balanced fleet and let me <coughs> emphasize that this navy has been transformed in the course of more than two decades. So transformation takes time. And second is how do we see transformation in forms of uh, in, in the uh, area of maritime domain is that um, this navy usually they have identified what future contingencies are and determined their attitude towards these contingencies. And then they create scenarios and what to do in the next decades and then they build the capacity on that basis. The approaches uh, to technology innovation in maritime domain uh, at me uh, site wide what uh, George Peel uh, has written in his book. He listed many, actually, about others having the people, giving in touch with technologically, with service relations and else. But he did emphasis on men rather than technology, as we other writers on that subject. Uh, that good men with poor ship is better than uh, poor ship with uh, good men. And so, um, sorry, good man with good ship is better than poor man with good ship. And um, when we talk about transformation, we also need to remind ourselves that this has to be done within the corridor of achieving what we call a balanced fleet. That we need to balance between military tasks, economic tasks, and also the responsibility tasks of the Navy. I'm not going to um, explain about the uh, what happened in, in uh, other countries. I think uh, uh, is and other uh, speakers have already uh, done a better job with that. I will look on uh, Indonesian and Polish Uh Next, please. Uh, next. 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 Okay. Um, Indonesian. Navy has changes, uh, especially uh, after the reform. Um, we have several uh, news uh, defense white paper which uh, basically underline the strategic trends, the contingencies that we want to tackle, and how are we going to tackle that. But when we see defense white paper, we have several already, 2003, 2008, 2015, we see shifting trends, and we see that instead of getting more focused on what issues that the military want to tackle, we are getting broader and broader identifications of threats. For example, in 2003, because white people we started identifying threats that mostly are very time based. But in 2015, defense white paper, uh, the government mentioned at least three different tra tracks, military and military hybrids, and um, in between we have proxy war, terrorism, food war, and energy security, epidemic, and else. So uh, it, is, uh, it is obvious that, that the government, uh, or uh, in this uh, instance the military, are still having problems in identifying what are the competencies that they are going to focus on in the future. For me, however, uh, next. For me, however, we have um, a better look on what kind of uh, demand uh, in terms of goals, in terms of traditional and non-traditional goals. And if you look after the reform in 2002, 2003, uh, maybe I had lots of HADR uh, missions to tackle, and starting in 2005, they are. Um, challenge with a more uh, traditional role, which is uh, diplomacy in Abala, where we have um, areas uh, with, uh, we have a country with uh, Malaysia over the border. And then um, in 2011, we have something quite new, which is an expedition mission to Somalia in order to uh, set free a ships. Uh, Indonesian ships that's been um, taken over by uh, I don't know. so the current event uh, actually 
Um, he may say that uh, it requires more and more traditional um, roles from the Navy. Uh, and uh, it is a few uh, very kind uh, issues, uh, dynamics, and uh, sort of dynamics. You see that uh, among the things that uh, the Navy are now getting more and more aware of is the border issues with China and also 10 other uh, countries. We have um, competition of uh, powers between the uh, United States and uh, China, which leads to U.S. strategic responsibility in Asia Pacific, uh, one of them being the, the positioning of uh, Marines in Darwin. It is very close to Indonesia and really very alarmed. And so, um, concluding uh, that kind of events that they has to face, then uh, it is only normal that Indonesia is thinking of getting small expeditionary missions, um, capability, while fighting uh, capability against bigger vessels and also establishing what we call a maritime identification zone. So we we'll have the ability to um, identify um, adversaries uh, from outside our territorial uh, waters. Okay, next. This is just a comparison of the Indonesian Navy uh, compared to other navies in the region. I'm not going to uh, explain it because uh, it has already uh, so the kind of follow-up next. Okay, next. Okay, so this is the kind of development of the uh, we we, from, we uh, currently have what we call the layered defense zone, which consists of bottom main defense and zone of resistance, as you may see. That um, the formations of our deployment actually center on Java Island. It's the one in the middle. Uh, it is actually a Java business defense. And um, what kind of transformation or changes that can be in place? Uh, next. Okay, um, starting in 2014, when we have uh, our Congress uh, event at Google, Proclaiming Indonesia as the global government program, we kind of assume that the Navy will take uh, precedence over other uh, services in the armed forces. But then uh, we see also a very dynamic um, discourse over what Navy organization should be in the future and how we are supposed to uh, finance that. Um, one of the uh, significant changes that I are taking at the moment is that there is uh, an idea and a plan to resolve the two fleets that we are currently have, the eastern and the western fleets, to have it resolved into one, but that one fleet will be in charge with three commands in west, in east, and in central area. This is uh, waiting for the presidential uh, position and this is uh, included in the 100 day program of the current uh, military uh, chief of armed forces. This signifies changes from in depth defense to forward defense. And the second is that we're going to have what we call an island based state aircraft carrier uh, in three islands in response to escalating um, conflict that we can solve in Asia. Um, the military base, which will be uh, equipped with radar, unit hospital, integrated hangar, water service, etc., signifies changes from single service or dual service approach to military base into integrated tri service military base, which is a very uh, significant leap for Indonesia. The third is uh, the, the third change that I want to mention is the plan to acquire satellite military satellite technology, which will enable us to have a full cover of surveillance over the countries. But we will only rely on several riders that are operate on 24/7 uh, 
uh, uh, OIC, and then uh, we have several spots that cannot be identified, cannot be covered. By uh, procuring this satellite, uh, this will definitely change uh, the way Indonesia uh, having its uh, domain lens in maritime, uh, in maritime uh, sectors. And, um, and basically, uh, our Tanya commander also uh, emphasized that, you know, uh, the involvement of the United Nations, the development of Indonesia may be based on integrated fleet weapon system and also the development of technology based reservist operating systems uh, will be our priority uh, in the next future. However, there are several challenges to the transformation, the process strategy culture will still, uh, much of our operational tasks are still uh, done in uh, online. And um, hopefully, uh, in the future, we will be able to uh, shape our strategy culture uh, with more and more engagement of maybe uh, with uh, traditional goals. And the second is the struggle to find the balance because uh, from what we see uh, from the budget, at least uh, in the past five years, we don't uh, allocate enough budget for the um, process, especially for the making. Maybe it's not the with this uh, receiver of our budget portion, uh, this brings question to whether we can have uh, a meaningful transformation. And the third is that we still have problem with technological adaptation capacity. Uh, in which we don't have a good track records in terms of uh, adopting. Uh, we we well we tend to see adopting as buying from outside, and uh, this is. Uh, well, obviously not going to help if we want to have uh, a meaningful transformation which either we should be supported by our own international piece. So let me um, conclude my presentation by saying that there has been changes in our uh, Indonesian uh, naval defense, changes in terms of employment, changes in terms of technology acquisition, but we are yet to see the changes in doctrines. The doctrines remains the same for the past uh, years. And the second is that in order to have a meaningful transformation, in which can lead to overcome some impediments, its strategy culture must be changed, the affordability of the states, uh, we need a more creative uh, budget for upholding the transformation, and the third is that we need to have a more uh, strategy in the entire technology adoption, uh, not only uh, uh, emphasizing on buying, but also to engage more and more. Uh, and also our international needs. Okay, I will start my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Komitri. Uh, we had, uh, we have uh, three brilliant panelists here. Um, so it's going to be firstly already elaborate very well how the development of hardware, naval hardware exists and how um, how countries actually develop the uh, naval industrial uh, base. And Tino uh, and uh, here have actually elaborated how that hardware is needed to support the sensitivity of increasingly uh, cyber security base that uh, cover all domains of the uh, uh, airspace. Um, and that would, uh, we, we continue to include how this particular country, Indonesia, at the basic point, uh, reacted and developed its uh, strategy, strategy, naval maritime strategy, into uh, in facing these yeah, challenges. And, and uh, perhaps my conclusion uh, from is a country responding in two ways. Uh, first is through industrialization, uh, taking the note that we need to uh, advance technologically, but again, the, there's a constraint in budget and uh, technological skill and capacity, and therefore we need to develop research and technology, but not all countries is capable uh, to do so. And secondly, maybe through change of doctrine, through integrated system, uh, in Indonesia case, uh, not only system domain, but it's all uh, domain, and also the integrating system is in hybrid and solar. Uh, now for the first session, I would open the uh, first Q&A session for three questions from the floor or comments, if there is any. One, uh, two, sir. Uh, 
movements after the island permission, they only uh, set up key uh, facilities on the artificial islands and but nothing further or uh, nothing further more nothing. Only the US doing their own thing uh, maritime uh, point of point of the point of I think uh, that's become a routine. Uh, it that the U.S. has nothing to to uh, accept the fact that China is already uh, uh, get the foothold in the market region, bigger market, bigger economic market region. But at the same time, uh, Chinese government have to accept that it is the right, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is the interest of the U.S. to ensure the freedom of navigation in the market region. So basically they accept it try to find a way, uh, a baseline, a baseline to how not to escalate the current situation in South At the same time, uh, we have to look at also uh, the bigger, uh, the, the, the broader relationship uh, in between US and China. Uh, not only it, it is, uh, the US relationship with China is not only limited to the South Korea Sea issue, uh, but also to other uh, pressing issues like uh, uh, Relationships, commercials, and also see uh, how to enter the study in, uh, in the Korean Peninsula uh, and so on and so forth. I think that uh, because uh, if, you, if you look at the current matter, it is the dynamic that is relationship. I think neither side would like to have to like to affect. Iran and 
brush the army into the temple. That's my idea. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, 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 I hope I didn't say anything about it. I was referring to actually the stages of the uh, question set by Council uh, Murray. There are six stages, and uh, I kind of conclude Indonesia is still on the third and fourth stages, which is desperation and uh, adoption of intermediate combat methods. Uh, but, uh, of course, the issue of WAP is a bit interesting, and in Asia, I, uh, I believe that, uh, as in other countries as well, uh, the issue is on the capacity and intention. For capacity, uh, Indonesia has that, of course, for example, if you want to create nuclear uh, weapons, we have the capacity with it, uh, exporting uh, nuclear for some, uh, uh, some years so far, but only for uh, many purposes. Uh, if you want to say develop uh, chemical or biological, in this case, <laughs> sources of many diseases, uh, uh, transmitted diseases, uh, and uh, we really issue is about intention and our intention is limited by our commitment to international law, to regional conventions, and we are committed to our friends in ASEAN and not going to use nuclear weapons. And, and so uh, I think uh, you don't have to be worried about the word uh, that we have the uh, by that side. Uh, I would also to uh, contribute uh, an answer for uh, our part. I know, about the joint for women in Asia and Germany. We had, we had uh, MOUs with uh, Germany uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, now it's uh, recently activated, and uh, some of the uh, potential areas of cooperation includes uh, Technology, uh, with the technology and exchange of experts. And I believe that some of uh, the issues from the government have always tried to open that cooperation. And uh, my suggestion is that uh, probably the EV could propose a reason of events to have better uh, events with Germany, uh, the one that we already had with China, with Russia, and else, so that we will place the cooperation in a wider uh, interest. Not only in terms of TNI as users, but also industry and government to make sure that as we look at this type of industry, we will also create a uh, multiplied effect for the economy. Thank you for the excellent response. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, uh, two issues. Uh, the first one was on the summary. So. Uh, I guess in principle, uh, uh, my pleasure to give an answer on your own questions uh, here uh, in the region. Uh, I would uh, uh, say this way, I would come to the presentation. Uh, it's of, of course uh, copyright uh, as of today, but um, the security environment is changing dramatically. When you look at German prosperity, actually, uh, where we sell most of our cars, it's on Germany, uh, it's here in Asia. Uh, and we can make our money in Asia and be not done. So this will change. Germany will have the presence here to hold on to on trading and other things. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a security dimension. I would encourage you, uh, you see, the defense ministers and chancellors have with promises that they visit us. Uh, this, is, this is a way to overcome uh, such things. Uh, I think it would be also very interesting uh, and helpful for the German name to participate here in such exercises uh, because again China is everywhere. China is in Europe and uh, by being here we learn much faster about how to deal with challenges. Uh, so as I said, uh, the answer of today would be no, uh, but we don't know when tomorrow is first, tomorrow, next year, two years, so people are asking. Uh, on the cyber issue, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, come this way. Uh, I think uh, cyber is not the issue of today, it's rather the issue of yesterday. Uh, so uh, I, I'm sure uh, 
possible opponents are in your networks already. Uh, they are in your neighbor networks. Uh, persistently, silently. Uh, they know how to jam your communication uh, and they know how to spoof your signals. So, take this uh, as a baseline. That my uh, recommendation would be, and the models, of course, uh, confidential vulnerability uh, analysis, uh, and then come up with a policy. With a proposal without government, without policy, there's no money. Without no money, the whole thing is an illusion. So, we need uh, the government behind it uh, with a policy, and then we need to uh, start working. <coughs> In the cyber direction, which is uh, protect your networks, A, and B, develop cyber skills, both on defensive and on offensive. And that means, as I said, it means structure. From doctrine, we can learn from others. There are other nations that have developed uh, respective uh, cyber doctrines. Uh, you have to have uh, personal careers in the people that these people need to be trained. For. Uh, and as cyber development groups, uh, they will be uh, in the kind of permanent training. What is of utmost important, at least as the big one from my uh, military background, is uh, the other disconnect between operational leadership and technology. Uh, when you look at the cyber aspects, meaning the IT and the communications, uh, this is a thing that normally uh, an operational commander says. Yeah, because it's my guys, they have to fix the problem. They underestimate actually uh, the uh, added value that you can gain from the cyber operations. So the uh, operational commanders have uh, uh, learning deficits, most potential in learning about uh, this technology, while the technical experts have to do the knowledge about the operational requirements, so they have a uh, learning deficit regarding to uh, operational challenges. And, and this has come by accident. We have to start doing this uh, uh, exercise in the So this will be my, my suggestion. Uh, the question then uh, that always comes on how, uh, uh, how can not so rich nations uh, do that? Or, uh, I think uh, the less rich you are, the faster you have because you cannot avoid wasting money. Uh, it's your security, and you have security concerns. So invest wise instead of later. Oh, very excellent, excellent um, uh, deep suggestion that Conrad um, um, has provided us. Thank you so much. Uh, now uh, I would like to open uh, for another session of question. Uh, perhaps, okay, I need to, if there is any email, I would encourage, maybe not, okay. Uh, maybe two uh, gentlemen in the black and white and the one the black and white stuff. I hope you can make it uh, short. Uh, to my question, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very enlightening presentation. I wonder if I'm not mistaken, the last speaker mentioned about change the strategy. And then the explanation from the German the colonel said that the, the, the how do we use effectively our budget to offer security? So, how do you make? in between creating such kind of uh, minimum essential forces to cope with the challenges and more changing strategy. Because uh, this is related to high tech more back. If it's a marine, adapt and improvise. But this we cannot do that. Because this is uh, the parameter of the so way. Thank you very much. And I am this kind of example, I am a former people. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the question, great, thank you. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Tom from CSIS, and thank you for the presentation of the guests. Very insightful. Uh, two quick questions for uh, press to Mr. Yates, Mr. and uh, Dr. Sapitri. Uh, the first question for Mr. Yates. Uh, is there any, are there any uh, initiative or some things uh, from ASEAN countries uh, to build cybersecurity capability in the neighborhood domain? 
and then can you give a quick comment on the urgency of uh, do any countries need it now or does it uh, do any countries just need it in a more broader, more broader context of cyber uh, security in ICT? And then the second question is uh, it's the same question, but addressing in, in the context of Indonesia maybe for uh, Dr. Sabiri. Or, uh, I think the members of the table would like yeah. to it's, it's the same question. Uh, is there any initiatives um, in the in the NATO domain to build cyber security uh, capability in Indonesia? And can you give a comment on the urgency? Do we need, do we need it now or no? Okay. Thank you uh, for. Uh, the question, uh, maybe we can go uh, around and, and uh, in, well, uh, we ask for the panelists uh, the by the to give uh, answer to the question that they can answer and uh, please give comments to, to um, our session, perhaps the so, uh, last statement if you may. Uh, emphasize on value rather than 
maintaining the high quality from research, concept development, manufacturing, upgrade to disposal. Uh, and now we are trying to incorporate a uh, better way of approaching and uh, which is uh, incorporating life cycle costing. And I think uh, the president has already mentioned this a lot of time, and this is one of the agendas in our defense application. And hopefully, uh, by uh, we are in the middle of the essential forces, the second stage, uh, the second stage, um, three stages, and uh, we are hoping that the third stages will will incorporate this. Uh, so we can be more selective in uh, in the in adopt in, in adopting the right technology. Uh, we uh, with our eyes set on how the technology could help us uh, in achieving with the effectiveness, how the technology will be funded through the light. Uh, it's operational up to its disposal and only by doing that I believe we can create a network or in this case a process transformation that we have all the confidence in the achieve the level of the effectiveness to the reach at the level of uh, budget that's there to perform. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Uh, must be, uh, the, 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 the yeah, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, about the uh, cyber diplomacy or cyber cooperation to meeting ASEAN and Asia Martin, uh, first, before coming to uh, that particular aspect, I think we have to look at the basic also of the cyber security. The first, I think there are apparent that there, there are uh, four. Uh, 
venture uh, cyber security cooperation uh, taking place in, in the region. So I think, I think uh, what we have today is how we, uh, how the ASEAN members refine those mechanisms and forums so as not to uh, become effective in a way, but to ensure uh, practical cooperation uh, uh, taking place in the region. Yeah, I think uh, that's, that's, that's my thing. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Pidassa. Uh, are there any last words? Uh, the few. Uh, uh, on transformation, we have been the Buddha's uh, transformation commander. So, uh, I would say, uh, for relations on the transformation uh, uh, plan that we have, uh, important this direction, and then also to uh, deliver. I think this is uh, very important to uh, take. People along, they need to focus that uh, they are coming with the worries that they have to do their job. So, so, this is my experience from there. Uh, the, uh, on the, the cyber issue, just one, one more. I had a discussion this morning with one of your main officers. Um, cyber is not just a strategic issue, although this is a resource. What are you doing on your ship? Can command control is down. Uh, it's going to fix it. Somebody from your car over there, we need somebody on board to do the So this one is all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and we uh, get a round of applause from the Please hear much. Thank you.